going to turn this over to Neil, and he's going to introduce Peter. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Sustainable Design Masterclass. We're really happy to have you here. Uh, really pleased that you're willing to share your time with us. Uh, Peter's been on my radar for a number of years now, but uh, we actually, I actually got to visit his farm earlier this year, and it was a fantastic experience for me, and I knew I wanted to get Peter on because uh, Peter's a uh, trained ecologist who started start farming. And so he's got a lot of, you know, the book smarts, but he's also got a lot of the street smarts and that he's producing things, he's working within his local market, and he's facing the realities of what it actually means to be a farmer. And uh, that's my favorite kind of person to talk to. He's, he's super smart. I've seen the presentation he's going to give us today. I loved it the first time I saw it. I think you're going to love it as well. So uh, let's turn it over to you, Peter, and we'll be Hey, uh, thanks. I My uh, webinar app here that I downloaded just crashed. I just rebooted it. Um, can you see my screen, or do I got to do something else here? Well, we can see you. Hey, yeah, everybody, let us know if you can see. Uh, we need to make you presenter real quick, so then let me make you presenter, then we can see your screen. Where are you? There you go. Okay. So now you're the presenter, now you can show your screen. Okay. Yeah, there's always there's always a little bit of a uh, little bit of lag when you're doing this, so stick with us, folks. We're gonna get this all sorted out very quick. There we go. So yeah, everybody, let us know when you can see um, Peter's presentation pop up. So Peter, what I, like I can it came see, up and then shut out again. Yeah, it came up and then it it shut out. So try opening up Keynote one more time. Well, is Peter still there? Yep. Yeah, I'm yeah. So it looks like he dropped him. Okay, great. So I can, yep, I can see the presentation. All right. So, yeah, can everybody else see it? It's visible now, says Yvette. Diane says she's got it. Erica says she can see him. Yeah, everybody's saying yes, so. Okay. Yeah, you're all, you're all good to go. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Peter Allen. Uh, I'm sitting here in Viroqua, Wisconsin. Our farm is about 15 miles from here. Um, and uh, we recently did get uh, high-speed internet brought out to the farm. I've got a little camper that I wired it out to, and I tried to get things going this morning, but I couldn't get the camper above about 5 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and it was okay for me. I didn't mind it, but the, uh, the, the internet router uh, wasn't functioning uh, at that temperature. So I had to uh, pack up and, and come here to town. Fortunately, uh, my wife and I have been here in this area for five years. Uh, we've been on our land for three years. Uh, and when we moved onto our land, we had a baby. And as soon as we announced uh, to our parents that we were having a child, uh, within six months of that time, both my mom moved to this area from Kentucky and uh, my wife's parents moved down here from Minneapolis. And so now we've We've got our, our parents right here, and so I'm at my mom's house right now here in Viroqua. It's nice and well above uh, 5 degrees Fahrenheit, and so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, and I'm going to talk to you guys about some of the uh, work that I've been engaged in for the last decade or so, um, studying ecology and applying that on the landscape uh, to do restoration and, and, and also agricultural at the same time. Uh, my background a little bit. I uh, uh, moved around a lot growing up, a whole lot. I was uh, actually homeschooled. We moved places about every year or two. Um, I ended up going to high school uh, in a very conservative place in uh, Indiana, and I ended up going to the big state, state school there, Indiana University, where for the first time I sort of learned about some of the issues going on in the world. I've been pretty fairly sheltered uh, in my upbringing and uh, was not aware of things like pollution and environmental degradation and stuff like that. So I kind of became a hippie in college, studied environmental science, um, 
and uh, got really into this idea of restoring ecosystems that had been degraded by humans uh, in various ways. And so I went to graduate school to study that further here in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, uh, did a master's degree there, studied sort of complexity theory and, and, and restoration ecology. And I was really interested in the oak savannas, uh, which I'm going to kind of go into here in a second, uh, talking about uh, sort of the history and ecology of savannas. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting paradox in that we know that savannas covered much of North America when, when the first Europeans arrived here and, and wrote stuff down and described what they saw. We read that now and it's like, oh yeah, that was a savanna. Um, it's, but it's kind of paradoxical because that was sort of like the ecosystem that was here, but then if you come here now and you take a piece of barren land and let it go, it doesn't turn into a savanna. Uh, it turns into a forest. So uh, how do we manage for savannas? That was, a, that was a question that I was really deep in at the university and sort of had this realization that the only way we could do it was via agriculture. Uh, and I'm going to kind of go through that process now. Um, and so the last five years have been a transition away from academia to actual farming. I started out, um, came to Mark Shepard's place and checked his place out uh, just for the, the dissertation that I was working on, but then ended up staying and getting some cattle, uh, kind of fell in love with the area. Uh, we bought land uh, uh, in the area and uh, been here ever since, and I have no intention of ever leaving. It's uh, uh, the most beautiful place in the world, and uh, Despite the frigid temperatures right now, I'm uh, pretty happy here. So let's go ahead and get started. The, the, the first part of this talk, I kind of want to uh, talk a little bit about the ecology of what's going on here. Um, I'm going to, uh, I, I heard there's a lag with changing slides, so there's about a four to five second lag. I apologize for that. Uh, hopefully it won't be too bad. Right now is a slide that I just pulled off of Wikipedia talking about succession. So basic concept in ecology, if you take a piece of bare ground, it goes through a, a process of succession towards a vegetated state. So if you literally start with bare rock, the first thing that happens is mosses come on board. You get some algae, lichens type things, and then you get your grasses and your perennials, uh, or an annual forbs, your uh, weeds, uh, and then you start getting faster growing woody uh, vegetation, and then your slow growing climax vegetation. So this is kind of the standard uh, narrative of, of modern ecology is this idea of succession from a bare state to a climax state, which in the eastern United States, because we have adequate moisture, the climax vegetation is uh, the hardwood forest dominated by uh, maple, basswood, uh, depending on if you're north or south, there's different mix of species, but shade-loving trees that grow in the shade of the forest and, um, and you end up with a closed canopy forest system. Um, so the interesting thing here, though, is that the ecosystems that our ancestors, the first Europeans, uh, encountered when they came to, the, to North America was not a closed forest. Uh, it was an open savanna. And so uh, that is what I want to kind of get into now. What, what does that mean? Why was that the case? Um, one of my heroes, Aldo Leopold, was the first director of the Arboretum back at, in Madison at UW. They started in the, de the Depression. They got land for really cheap, 1,200 acres, right in the middle of Madison. It's a pretty cool spot. Um, but in, in, the, in the inauguration for the Arboretum, he was you know, kind of romantically describing the, uh, the oak savanna or the oak opening ecosystems that were here uh, and how they were described by uh, uh, our ancestors as open, orchard-like stands of oaks interspersed with shrubs and, and prairie grasses and flowers in between. Uh, this open... Uh, diverse ecosystem was very prevalent across the Midwestern United States all the way from Canada down to Mexico in the middle part of the state. And the, the eastern part of the state was more forested um, at least after the virgin soil epidemic uh, that killed all the Native Americans in the 14 and 1500s. Uh, and then there was also this this map here doesn't really show that. The one on the bottom kind of shows the, the oak savanna in California in the Pacific Northwest, uh, the Central Valley. California, uh, different oak species, but the same basic ecosystem with open-grown oaks uh, and then sh uh, fruit and nut-bearing shrubs and uh, prairie grasses and flowers in between that was forage for, for large animals. Um, 
often described, if you go back and look at the historical literature uh, and the, the journals of some of the old explorers, the French and English, uh, Spanish, they always described how beautiful uh, and, and they often used phrases like park-like or orchard-like, almost like it was intentionally planted. Um, and that was the dominant ecosystem across North America uh, up until uh, fairly recently. But right now, that ecosystem has pretty much completely disappeared. It's considered the most endangered ecosystem in North America, less than 0.02% remaining. Uh, essentially what happened is that savannas create, through their ecological functioning, they create uh, deep, fertile topsoil. Uh, and so the Europeans that came to this area, they found the topsoil and they realized that this grew better grain than any other type of soil. So uh, the savannas became crop fields uh, pretty quickly. So the oak trees were largely burned out and grubbed out and then the, uh, the landscape turned into to crop fields. Where, where savannas uh, persisted for a while was on pretty steep slopes that were too steep to plow. Um, and those landscapes were largely grazed uh, up until about World War II. Many of the old savanna landscapes were grazed. Uh, once World War II came uh, and the industrialization of agriculture kind of went into full swing, um, a lot of farmers that were doing grazing with sheep and cattle you know, focused on um, mechanized industrial agriculture and, and some of those side projects like grazing got uh, dropped. And then what happens in that situation when you have a savanna that's being grazed and then you let bring the animals off, it quickly grows up into woody vegetation. And then it goes through a transition from a savanna into a forest. And basically what happens first is you've got oak trees scattered around. You remove the animals uh, and some of those acorns might germinate into oak trees, but then you have an oak forest uh, and the, the key thing about oaks is they cannot regenerate in the shade. So an oak forest is not a, a permanent ecosystem. It's a very temporary ecosystem because they can't regenerate in their own shade. Uh, so trees that can regenerate in their shade, like maple, elm, ash, um, birch, beech, those kind of trees start to take over and then you lose your oaks. Uh, and then in 100 years you've got a, a closed canopy hardwood forest uh, with no oaks. So that's Essentially, we've either grubbed them out for crops or we've let them go and they've transitioned into a forest. Um, the Driftless area where I'm at now uh, used to have a lot of oak savanna on our hillsides and they've all turned into forest. There's very, very little savanna left. Um, so, you know, this is some of the things that I was studying. It's like, how can we, how can we bring back these savannas? Uh, I came across a publication in a library, uh, 1995 Midwest Oak Ecosystems Recovery Plan. All these scientists from all over the eastern United States came together and like, what are we going to do? Uh, the oak savannas have disappeared, and not only that, but the oaks have been not regenerating, even in areas where they theoretically should. For lots of reasons, one being overpopulation of deer. Um, for lots of other ecological reasons, we have overpopulations of deer. We don't have great natural predators, the wolf is gone, so we have way too many deer than we should, and they prefer to eat oak seedlings, and so you, you lose out oak region in areas where you have overpopulation of deer. That's one factor. There's climate. There's a whole bunch of other factors. Uh, but these guys got together, and, and I read through this, this booklet that they published, and I was really excited at first until I kind of dove into it, and and you see, this is just from the first page. They're trying to restore the natural ecosystem functions, natural range of biotic community types, and where natural selection can operate. And you see this, and it's like, well, you look at the Earth today, and it's not natural anymore. Uh, humans are kind of everywhere doing, changing it in all sorts of ways. And so to try to recreate a natural situation like they're trying to do, to me, is uh, not feasible or possible or even necessarily desirable in that it, it can't work. So we've got to figure out other ways to do it that don't require humans completely. Uh, I mean, in order to accomplish this, you basically need to exterminate humans from the planet, which I don't think is uh, politically acceptable uh, or acceptable in any, in, from any perspective. So anyway, uh, that's not going to work. And, and the, the myth that sort of underlies that those intentions to create the natural system is this idea of the pre- settlement wilderness here in North America that before Europeans came 
Uh, North America was covered by a vast wilderness, and there, sure there were people here, but they were hunters and gatherers, and those hunters and gatherers were sort of within that wilderness system, just eating uh, food that popped up in the wilderness, uh, not necessarily active managers shaping that system. They were more passive bystanders within that system. Uh, and that's, this myth has kind of been, is, is critical to the, the story of North America uh, and the way we as Americans see ourselves in this world um, or on this continent. This, this myth is, is a lot of, uh, has a lot of weight in that story. And so when you realize how, when you, when you really peek into the details and the ecological history, um, this myth starts to fall apart. And when the myth falls apart, it makes you really reconsider a lot of your um, uh, uh, assumptions about the past and our, our current place in the world. So now I want to talk a little bit about the Native Americans and how they were managing. And this is, doing this research really opened up my eyes to what it means to to have a savanna and what savannas are for um, and how they exist in the first place. So um, Native Americans were the keystone species in North America. Uh, keystone species simply means that it's one species within a matrix of many others in an ecosystem and that the one that has sort of the most uh, disproportionate impact on all the other species would be like the keystone species. Um, you know, elephants in an African uh, brushland would be a keystone species. Um, an oak tree is a keystone species of, 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 the, of the savanna or, a, of, or an oak woodlands. Um, but Native Americans were like the ultimate keystone species in North America. And there was a variety of activities that they did on the landscape that influenced the landscape. And I'm going to kind of go through those uh, real quick. The number one way that they modified landscapes was through the use of fire, uh, controlled burning. Um, is like this quote says, probably the largest, uh, most extensive form of prehistoric management anywhere in the United States. Um, so when we're talking about burning here, we're not talking about light torching down a forest and a forest fire. We're talking mostly about uh, understory vegetation, so small, low intensity fires uh, that is burning up dried grasses and shrubs, uh, not fires that go up into the canopy. So we're talking about an understory of a savanna or an open woodland burning the ground cover. Uh, especially in the fall was when it was most often uh, burned, and it was burned for literally hundreds and hundreds of reasons. One is to control the migration patterns of large animals like bison and elk. Uh, another is to, uh, an another example I like is uh, Hazelnuts, uh, shrubs were used as um, the, 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 the shoots of hazelnut shrubs were used as arrows. And the natural growth pattern of a hazelnut is a little bit spirally. It kind of spirals as it grows up. But if you burn the shrub first, the, the first shoots that come out of a burned hazelnut shrub are really straight. So, you know, hazelnuts would be burned to produce straight arrows. Um, you'd burn underneath oak trees. So... Uh, acorns were a staple crop uh, for most of the human beings. Most of the human beings that have ever existed on this planet have uh, had acorns as a staple crop. Uh, North American Indians, not uh, with no no exception there. So, in, uh, acorns were a staple crop. So, in order to harvest acorns, you know, you go collect them under oak trees. So they would burn just before the uh, oaks would drop their acorns to clear the vegetation to make it easy to harvest and to clear out any worms or uh, pests that might be in there that would otherwise compromise the crops. Um, so many, many, many reasons to burn and what the, the result of this burning over the long term means they were maintaining open ecosystems. They, they didn't allow succession to turn it into a closed climax forest. They were keeping it held back um, because the, the most the, the foods that they ate, the berries, the fruits, the nuts, they were all a part of this early successional community and they needed that disturbance to, to push succession back to maintain this productive state. Um, and so burning was a, a huge thing that happened in most places, most years, uh, and it's really difficult to comprehend that scale of intentional fire on the landscape. Um, uh, another uh, main uh, Landscape influencing activity was uh, hunting. Uh, they were active, active hunters, especially white-tailed deer. Um, 
in the, in the eastern United States. And what that did was influence the vegetation. Like I said, uh, oaks are having a difficult time regenerating because of the overpopulation of deer. Um, if we were to hunt those deers more effectively uh, or had wolves, say, on the landscape, then the oaks would do a better job. Uh, and so, you know, there's a relationship between the vegetation that grows and the, and the herbivores that eat it. So by controlling the herbivore populations via hunting, you can control the vegetation population. So um, Native American villages and communities were, were semi-nomadic. So they would set up a village in a place, and that village may be there for anywhere from 10 to 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, but at some point, you've been in a village long enough that you've really depleted the resources around that village. You've cut down a lot of the trees, you've gathered a lot of the timber resources, you've hunted down a lot of the animals, and so you move your village. Uh, and the, the meta-landscape um, uh, consequence of that mobile activity means that, yes, you overhunt in small pockets, but in the larger landscape you're maintaining viable populations because you leave. It's like rotational grazing. You graze the grass down, but the, the critical thing for the, the sustainability of your grazing operation is that you then leave that paddock and let it regrow and regenerate, and then you don't come back. You let it fully rest and recover before you come back and graze it again. And so you could kind of think about uh, Native American village ecology and, and hunting activities as rotational rotational life, rotational villages where you, you overhunt an area and then you let it go and let it recover. And so you always have areas that are being hunted and always have areas that are, that are being recovered. So anyway, uh, major influence on the landscape because of this mobile village and, and hunting activities. Uh, and then the, the third one here that a lot of people don't really think about is, is active horticulture. So um, intentionally planting uh, ge specific genetics of plants uh, for food. So um, wild rice, there's a photo here of uh, women harvesting wild rice up in northern Minnesota. Uh, the native range of wild rice is up along northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin. Uh, but there was wild rice as far south or as northern Illinois, hundreds and hundreds of miles outside of its normal native range, but humans brought it down there uh, and, and kept it going down there. Uh, of course it's not there anymore, but um, that's an example of them moving stuff around. Uh, now it's you can actually, a lot of ecologists find unintentionally discover old Indian village sites because of the change in the uh, species composition of the forest. So you'll be in say a, a maple forest and then you'll come across a grove of plum trees and apple trees and hickories and acorns and walnuts and then it's like wait, 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 what, what's going on here? There's all these fruit and nut producing trees in this tiny little area, all surrounded in 100 miles in every direction by maple trees. How did these get here? We start digging around, and it's like, oh, this is an Indian village site. They actually planted these trees here. So um, there's evidence in New England of the Iroquois actually trading um, uh, genetics of, of fruit and nut trees, seeds. Um, so there was an active horticultural economy. Uh, corn, and squash, and beans brought up from the southwest over hundreds of years to, to uh, select and evolve uh, varieties of each of those things that can survive the northern climates because uh, they all evolved down in uh, uh, Central America. So uh, serious, serious horticultural activities happening that changes the landscape. Now we've got fruit and nut trees in places that there weren't before because people brought them there and, and got them started. So. Um, so you add all this up, the, the burning, the hunting, the horticulture, and that's when you get this concept of a, of a keystone species, the human beings, that had basically the result of them being on the landscape was to replace what would otherwise be forested land, closed forest, with um, open savanna, uh, highly productive, more food for animals, more forage for, for, for herbivores, plus all the fruits and nut crops that can't grow in the shade of a forest. Forests are relatively low diversity uh, compared to savannas. Um, and so what you end up having is you have this, uh, back to the succession uh, chart from Wikipedia, if going from bare ground to forest, you know, what you end up having, this number three here, you end up having 
a combination of the forest and the grassland in a savanna. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get the diversity, uh, the extra diversity of having both the trees and the grasses, but you get the the, the nut-producing trees, the oaks, the hickories, the walnuts, which don't like closed forest situations, uh, they persist, and uh, as long as you have a keystone species creating this disturbance pattern uh, that maintains a savanna, you kind of get the best of both worlds. And so that's what the Native Americans did. They, they replaced what would have been uh, a closed canopy forest with uh, an oak savanna. Okay, so humans have been here in sizable numbers, we know, for since the end of the Ice Age 10,000 years ago, basically. So we, we know it's been roughly a savanna, uh, at least in this part of the country in the Midwest, for 6,000 years. Right after the glaciers melted, it was more like boreal forest. It was still really cold. It took a while to warm up. The climate's been about, about even here for about 6,000 years. That's starting to change, but it's been warm, temperate, mild uh, uh, for the last 6,000 years. And we've had savannas for up until the last couple hundred years. So the question is, is what was the ecosystems like before humans got here, right? So we had, North, we had in North America, you know, humans arriving 10,000 years ago. What was the ecosystems like before those 10,000 years ago? And we might think, well, they, it was a wilderness. It must have been this closed canopy forest. There was no people here to burn it. Um, so it must have been this primeval wilderness. Maybe, maybe it just wasn't 200 years ago. Maybe it was, you know, 10,000 years ago, which would be true if it weren't for these guys, um, along with many others. Uh, we didn't have Indians burning. We had giant animals eating. Uh, so we didn't even have closed canopy forests here before humans got here. It was open savanna even before then. Um, there's a book that I just came across, uh, so I threw the, the image in here. Uh, book called Grazing Ecology and Forest History. It's a guy uh, out of the Netherlands uh, who's a part of the rewilding work and projects going on over there. But uh, this is his dissertation basically saying very similar things to what I'm saying here in that uh, we have these notions of ancient primordial forests and that that might not actually be an accurate depiction of the past that because of the action of all of these large mammals that used to live here and all the, the massive herds of herbivores roaming around the landscape that instead of a primeval forest in in his case he's talking about Europe in our case North America instead of that forest we actually had open grassland savannas um, so here's just a, 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 a an image showing you some of the, the amazing diversity of uh, large mammals we had here in North America camels evolved here uh, interestingly enough and then spread out um, mastodons actually evolved in Eurasia and they came about 17 million years ago so they were here for about 17 million years uh, they were the largest herbivores the mastodons and so they were kind of like the keystone species they ate trees they ate whole trees so they'd come into a, in a wooded area knock down the trees you know they weighed many tons they just knock trees down and then use their trunk to strip off uh, the leaves and, and stuff so you can imagine the, the destruction and damage disturbance that that caused when you've got a, a, a herd of say 20 or 100 or 500 mastodons walking up through a valley uh, destroying trees. So what happens is you might have a wooded area, the, the animals knock it down, uh, all of a sudden now sunlight can get in and you get other plants sprouting and growing grasses. Uh, and then once you get grasses coming in, grasses attract grazing animals. Your your bison, the bison that was the bison that we know here in North America is an actual relative newcomer. Um, the bison that was here for most of the, our evolutionary history, or at least what we're talking about for mammals over the last 20 or 30 million years, was actually a, a much much larger bison, about twice as large as the ones we have today. So big, big, big grazing animals eating lots of grass. You get those guys eating grass, and then it holds it into a grass ecosystem. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more here in a bit about the evolution of grassland ecosystems. Um, so the result of all these giant mammals, uh, giraffes, giant sloths, uh, mastodons and elephants and mammoths and uh, bison and elk and camels, the result of all that isn't a forest, it's an open savanna. So you, you Google, you know, Pleistocene or, or megafauna and like look at the images, you never see an image of a forest because if you have all of these animals, you can't have a forest. You have a shifting mosaics of grassland, shrubland, wooded areas, 
Uh, and that is really the, 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 what we're trying to recreate here is a, is a context where we can have a, these diverse, super productive ecosystems. So, uh, quick, whoops, I hit the wrong button here. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this concept of alternative stable states, which I think is really important. Um, and it helps me understand uh, how to manage ecosystems uh, and how to think about ecological change. Uh, we have this idea that things are relatively linear, and often in nature, uh, things aren't linear. They're very non-linear. So uh, alternative stable states is, is, is an idea that Nature it can exist in ecosystems in these relatively stable configurations, and then when they switch, they switch whole hog into a new stable configuration. So you don't have a gradual shift from one thing to another. You have basically catastrophic shifts or transformations. You reach a tipping point, and then you flip into a new state. A classic example is uh, clear water versus eutrophic. Um, so this part of, uh, we're in the driftless area where we didn't have uh, glaciation, but to the east and to the north, all of this state was glaciated, and when the glaciers uh, retreated 10,000 years ago, they left a lot of glacial lakes. So we were rich in aquatic habitat of these clear, clear, clear water uh, ecosystems that were just packed full of fish, uh, lots of aquatic vegetation, um, and then massive waterfowl migrations. And that was a system that was very stable for a very, very long time. Uh, when Europeans came in, they located often their towns right near uh, some of these lakes because of the abundant resources there and for transportation purposes. And the uh, uh, thing about Europeans is they're really good at uh, not dealing with their waste. So a lot of our, you know, the residential and municipal waste when you just got dropped right into these aquatic ecosystems, which loads phosphorus into the water. Phosphorus uh, is the limiting nutrient for algae growth. And you can load phosphorus into a, one of these clear water lakes for a really long time, uh, and nothing happens. It stays clear water. There's all these relationships that evolve between all of the organisms that help maintain it in that system. Uh, but you get to a point where you just get too much phosphorus, you get an algae bloom, and then the whole thing flips, because you get an algae bloom that sucks all of the uh, oxygen out of the water, then you lose your fish, you lose your aquatic uh, vegetation because they don't get sunlight because they're shaded out and then all of a sudden now you have this new system that is very stable once it's once it's flipped now you can't just back off on your phosphorus just a little bit to get your clear water system back you got to go all the way back to the beginning uh, because that eutrophic system is very stable uh, and so we have in many climates of the world their ecosystems there are stable states that can exist in those uh, places kind of dependent on climate clim climate, and uh, land use. Uh, and, and it's our job as managers, as farmers, to sort of decide what stable state we want and work towards the evolution of that state, a, a, a state where the where all of the components are connected in a, in a, in a complementary way. Um, and so you, we can think about our climate as a stable state, we've had a stable state climate for 6,000 years. It's been very, very stable. Uh, and that is changing right now. The Arctic is destabilizing, uh, and it's probably going to lose its ice cover. And that's going to cause wreak serious, serious havoc uh, on the jet stream, on global uh, distribution of uh, precipitation, and all, and all sorts of other things. So we're in a, in, a, in a place here where we're going to a new stable equilibrium. Eventually, one will develop, but we don't exactly know what that's going to look like, uh, where it's going to settle down, what the new patterns are going to be. We just know uh, we're, we're losing the, the stable state we've been in for a long time. OK. Uh, and so then we can think about grasslands and forests as stable state ecosystems. Now, Usually grasslands and forests are, you know, whether you have one or the other is dependent on moisture. So you have, if you have adequate moisture like we do in the eastern United States, you have, generally have forests as a climax community. In the west, uh, western United States, you don't have near as much moisture. Grassland is in a much a more uh, prominent uh, ecosystem in dry areas. Um, but say we're in the eastern United States, when, when the, the first settlers got here, we, got, we, had, we had the tall grass prairie. We were not forest. We were a prairie savanna ecosystem, so we were grassland. Uh, 
and the reason we had that is because we had a high disturbance frequency. We had Native Americans burning all the time to maintain that grassland state. Um, forests, the, what, the determining factor in forests is really the percentage of shade cover. Once you get going with uh, uh, continuous canopy forests, then that really limits the amount of species that can grow there, and you're going to end up with the same basic uh, few species there until you get a big disturbance, say a tornado or a forest fire in a dry year. So savannas is, is in between these two stable states. Um, it's a very unstable configuration because you've got trees now in a grassland situation. So trees are creating this, this shading, this canopy, which grasses don't like. Grasses can't grow in the shade. So you have this situation where you have forests battling grasslands and the savanna is kind of the edge of this battleground, but it's a very unstable situation. Um, one cool thing about that situation uh, is that you have intermediate disturbances. You have some disturbances enough to keep it grassland, but not enough to, um, or uh, enough disturbances that you get um, enough grasslands, but not too few that you turn into forests, but not too many that's just grasslands. Oaks are right in the middle, and that ecologists say that the, these intermediate levels of disturbance where you get this savanna is where you also have the highest level of species diversity, which is pretty cool. So we've got this um, system with a really unstable savanna that wants to go either forest or grassland, but it really doesn't want to stay uh, savanna on its own, and that's why it's so hard to do. You, Restoration ecologists haven't figured out how to restore savannas because if they've got those trees in there, in their system, it, it tends to go woody unless it's really well managed by disturbances. And ecologists are trying to, to return it to nature, so they don't want to like actively manage because they want it to be natural. Uh, but then it just turns into forest, so they can't keep the savanna. So like that uh, arboretum that I was talking about that Leopold started in, in the 30s, his objective was to restore savannas there, 1,200 acres. And you go there today, and there's no savanna. All the places where they had the savannas before have has gone into uh, closed canopy forests. The oak trees are still there. Some of them are still alive. Many of them are dead because they've been shaded out, but they're surrounded by larger maple trees. Uh, and there's no sunshine. There's no oak regeneration. The oaks will be gone there. So uh, savannas are incredibly unstable until they get a keystone species. Okay, So it's the, the, the keystone species that turns a uh, savanna from an unstable mixture of a grassland and forest into a stable system. Um, and it was the mastodons and the ground sloths and the camels uh, for you know 25 million years here in North America as keystone species maintaining these savannas. Uh, and it was Native Americans burning uh, and hunting and doing horticulture, maintaining savannas for the last 10,000 years, and now they're gone. And if we want them back, if we want to have uh, productive, resilient agricultural systems that are also ecologically restorative, uh, then we have to be those keystone species. Um, so the kind of take-home message with all of this is that Savannas, relative to grasslands are, and forests, are sort of the emergent property of highly functioning terrestrial ecosystems. So you get an ecosystem, and it starts evolving. And it, at the maximum evolution, where it's functioning uh, optimally, it looks like a savanna. Uh, it's got trees and shrubs and lots of animals. And the only way we can keep those systems and have those systems is to have those keystone uh, uh, species in there. And um, so I've got a few more slides here before I get into the keystone species bit. Uh, I, this is going to be some, uh, I'm going to skip some of this stuff because I've still got a lot of slides to go through here. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about grasslands and grassland ecology uh, and the importance of the grasses in the carbon cycle. Uh, and, and how important that is to these savanna grassland systems. So uh, this here is the root system of prairie plants. So this was put together uh, by an ecologist named Weaver when mapped all of these 
uh, the root systems of the prairie plants, and you can see that they get pretty darn deep. Uh, I think the bottom of the graph there is 15 feet. Many of those species are, you know, 10 feet or more. Uh, but if you look up in the, the very top left-hand corner of the, of the graph, that's Kentucky bluegrass. That's one of the dominant uh, eastern pasture grass species, and we have it in all of our pastures. It's a great grass. I love it. But look how shallow the roots are. I mean, the roots only go down maybe three or four inches. Um, they're really shallow rooted. So there's two basic types of grasses. There's the C3 or cool season pasture grasses, the your classic European pasture grasses. If you've got cows in a pasture, you've got the eastern pasture grasses. They're brome, timothy orchard, Kentucky bluegrass, uh, and they are cool season grasses. Um, and then you've got the prairie plants, the native uh, warm season C4. C4 and C3 are different photosynthetic pathways. The C4 grasses were, are the native prairie plants, the big blue stem, little blue stem, and these are the ones that have these gigantic massive root systems. Um, and so I just wanted to point this out to you and then mention here uh, something I'm sure you're, most of you are familiar with, this idea of a carbon pump, uh, the fact that as herbivores eat vegetation, uh, grasses slough off some of their roots and, and, and feed the, the microbes in the soil, which then creates organic rich uh, uh, soils that are full of carbon. So carbon gets pulled out of the atmosphere by plants uh, through photosynthesis into the, into the body of the plant. Uh, the animal eats some of that and a lot of it gets uh, trampled and, uh, and, and a lot of it gets exudated into the soil, which then creates fertile thick topsoils and actually to actually theoretically if you're grazing correctly and we're assuming that these old grasslands with a megafauna were actually pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it in the ground. Um, here's a, a graph from a, or a, an image from a, a paper uh, by a guy named Greg Retallick out of Oregon. Um, He's been studying the evolution of grazing animals and their uh, 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 relationships with the grasses. Uh, and grasses, grassland ecosystems, grasslands as ecosystems didn't evolve until relatively re recently, about 30 million years ago. Before that, there was basically forest ecosystems and there were animals that lived within the forest, but grasslands as ecosystems hadn't evolved yet and there were no animals that had evolved to eat grass. So forest ecosystems generally don't build thick topsoil. Uh, they'll have the layer of humus at the top and then um, they're more of a steady state ecosystem. Most of the carbon is locked up into the biomass of the forest and it's not in the soil. Um, but as you can see here on the graph, there's the first formation here. Uh, there's, there's these ancient soils that are mostly bedrock and mineral. There's like no organic matter there. Uh, same here, 31 million years ago. 31 million years ago, uh, Antarctic split off, Antarctica as a continent split off from, uh, from South America and that created a, uh, a new ocean circulation pattern because the ocean could circulate around uh, the Antarctic and, and it changed global climate significantly and things got really uh, dry and really cold and this is when grasses kind of started to gain an edge on the trees and this is when the first animals figure out ways to eat grasses. Grasses are full of silica, they're full of cellulose, they're not easy to digest, and they don't have much nutrition in them. So uh, you, like the horses were the first ones to do it. They developed what they call high crown molars, so they're able to grind the silica-rich grasses down and digest them. And if you've ever been around a horse, it's got to eat all the time because grass is such a poor quality resource that in order to run around and do its thing, it's got to be constantly eating and constantly pooping. Now, ruminants are better. Uh, ruminants came along a little later, but, but these horses were the first guys to figure out how to eat grass about 20 million years ago, and that's when grasslands as an ecosystem first emerged. When the first animals started eating grasses, the world was much cooler and drier, and grassland ecosystems at this point sort of took over, and now within a really quick amount of time, within you know a couple million years, we've got grasslands as major dominant ecosystems on every continent in the, on, on Earth, and we've got grassland uh, mammals that have evolved to eat. So we start out with the horses, and then we get the giraffes, and then we eventually get the evolution of uh, ruminants, 
the ancestors of sheep and goats and deer and elk and uh, cattle came on a little bit later, which are they're way more efficient at grazing grass. So they don't need to eat as much. They get more nutrient out of it. But the key thing here that I want to want to point out is the development of what we call mollusols or grassland soils uh, didn't happen until we had grasslands as ecosystems. And now all of a sudden you've got these grasses that are photosynthesizing, animals are eating them, and they're pumping carbon into the soil. And now all of a sudden you get big topsoil. So, you know, the top grain growing regions of the world right now in uh, Illinois, in Iowa, in, the, in North America, and in uh, some, some of the, the uh, lower steppe regions of Russia, uh, excellent grain growing regions because they have really, really thick topsoil that was created by grasslands over millions and millions of years. Not by forests, but by grasslands. Uh, and it was this co-evolution of grasslands and grazers which developed this ecosystem that pulled carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into the soils. Uh, the animations that I have set up here aren't working uh, on this webinar, so this graph is going to look really cluttered, but we're just going to go through it relatively quickly. Uh, 65 million years of climate change. So. Uh, we're going to start back here at 65 million years ago. Uh, 65 million years ago is when the, um, the meteor or comet came crashing into the Yucatan Peninsula uh, and seriously wreaked havoc, killed all the plants and all the animals in North America, uh, and then did major devastation on all the other continents. There was a nuclear winter, uh, and, and we had a massive die-off, uh, one of the major extinctions uh, in the planet's history. Uh, much of the, the oceanic life went extinct and almost all terrestrial life went extinct. Uh, after that period, that was the, you know, that was the end of the dinosaurs. That killed off all the dinosaurs. Mammals had evolved up until that point, but they hadn't really done anything. Uh, grasses had evolved up until that, up right at the end of that. The, most of the flowering plants had evolved right up before then. And then you know, the, the slate was wiped clean with the, with the meteor, and then all of a sudden we have ready to take over the world grasses, flowering plants, and mammals. Uh, and that's what ended up happening. So you get the first grasses, you know, right after the, the, the um, meteor, the grasses start to come take over the continent. Um, but here it took 12 million years for mammals to evolve from the size of a shrew up to the size of a squirrel. Uh, about 12 million years, but by 15, 17 million years uh, f from the, the meteor, we had large, relatively large, you know, we're up to horses, camels, beavers, peccaries, which are the ancestors of pigs, uh, rhinos, and rodents, so we got a lot of mammals going on then. 33 million years ago, the forests start breaking up, that's this moment where Antarctica breaks off and the ocean circulation patterns change. Um, 30 million years ago, we get um, squirrels and nut trees, I really love this, the, all of our nut trees, the deciduous uh, hardwoods, uh, evolved up in the Arctic Circle. Uh, you can imagine deciduousness uh, being a product of the high latitude areas where they have area, times of the year of intense light and times of the year with intense darkness. Uh, they did not evolve in the more temperate uh, lower latitude places. They evolved up in the up in the Arctic, and then once squirrels uh, and nut trees got together, they were an unstoppable force, and the squirrels brought the nut trees down. To, <laughs> so we have a lot to thank the squirrels for. That we have oaks and hickories and walnuts uh, here in the lower latitude regions. Um, and you know, this was a period of the, the climate had kind of tanked. It was really dry. Uh, a lot of the mammals went extinct, uh, and then we have. Right after that, about 20, 25 million years ago, uh, we have the evolution of horse with uh, high-crowned molars that can eat grass. We immediately get the spread of grass-dominant ecosystems. We get a radiation of all these uh, grazing mammals, you know, all the ruminants and all, uh, and the kind of peak mammal diversity. And what happens right from this point, so I want you to look at the, the arrow for peak mammal diversity right here, peak mammal diversity. So this is, this is the grassland ecosystems taking off and taking over all the continents. And this green line is the relative climate. Uh, and see how the temperature of the earth starts to drop once we've got these grassland ecosystems that are sequestering massive amounts of carbon in the soil. And you get to this point seven million years ago where the CO2 levels in the atmosphere had dropped way, way, way down. They were 
down to like 250 parts per million because they had been sequestered in the soils. Uh, they were in the soils and not in the atmosphere. Uh, and at 250 parts per million, plants have a really hard time doing photosynthesis. There's not enough CO2 in the air uh, to, uh, to efficiently photosynthesize. So that's, it was, a, it was a, a period of, of major stress for the plant world. And, and right at the same time, 7 million years ago, in 12 different plant families independently, uh, they evolved a new pathway, a new way of doing photosynthesis, which we call a C4 pathway. Um, and uh, some grasses and forbs and perennials and annuals, lots of different species evolved this new way of, of photosynthesizing. And it was more efficient, so they could photosynthesize in a carbon uh, depleted uh, atmosphere. And so these are those really tall and really deep rooted perennial plants that then took over from the C3s. It had been all C3s up until that point, the C4s took over. And so if we had a carbon pump that was pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it in the soil at this point, now we've got all these deep-rooted plants that are even more efficient at uh, sequestering carbon. So it goes into overdrive, uh, the cooling of the planet, and, and that is really the point where we start going into the ice ages. So right here, uh, where it starts going up and down, up and down, up and down, real big swings, these are the ice ages. So we've been having ice ages on planet Earth off and on about every 100,000 years off, 100,000 years of glaciation, where we have glaciers coming down as far south as you know the mid-latitude, North America, Indiana, uh, Iowa, glaciers coming that far south, and then we get a 10,000 year break where the glaciers recede back up into Canada, uh, and then 100,000 year, then 10,000 years of, of nice weather, and then, it, and then it gets cold again. And that's the pattern. We've been going back and forth with ice ages for the last three million years. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to point that out because it kind of puts it a little bit into context where we're at now. Uh, right now, we've got uh, 400 plus parts per million, which we haven't had uh, on planet Earth since back here. It has been about 70, about 15 million years since we've had uh, 400 parts per million CO2. Not since grasslands have existed have we had um, CO2 in the atmosphere this high. So anyway, whatever you think about CO2 and green, greenhouse gases or whatever, uh, that's the deal. We're going back in time. So in my opinion, we've got to restore functional ecosystems if we want a shot at keeping the Earth habitable for human beings in the future. Uh, and this is a, a global phenomenon. Our ecosystems have collapsed everywhere, uh, terrestrial and aquatic, as a result, mostly of agriculture. Uh, and we've got to get these ecosystems back uh, back in action with uh, trees and grasses and grazing animals. We've got to get this cycle, uh, this co-evolved co community, this savanna community back on the landscape. Uh, and in order to do that, in order to have these functional ecosystems, we've got to have keystone species. Okay, keystone species. So we're, we're, we're keystone species now, right? Yeah, of course we are. Um, we are we are completely controlling uh, and dictating what the landscape looks like, uh, what plants grow there, what plants don't grow there, what chemicals get applied there. Um, so right now we're a keystone species that is managing uh, uh, or basically killing uh, our ecology. So we are uh, overseeing their demise. And that's tragic, and we all know that that's going to stop. Um, so we've got to take over as keystone species of a positive ecosystem, of, of, an, of an actual ecosystem. This isn't an evolved functional ecosystem. This actually is closer to a, you know, a, a 200 million year old super dysfunctional ecosystem. Uh, not dysfunctional, but not evolved, an unevolved ecosystem. This is just a couple, you know, this is when the first plants came online and there was no soil yet and whatever. Um, so anyway, uh, we got to have a paradigm shift in order to become keystone species. We've got to re-enter as, uh, uh, as members of ecosystems, uh, the civilization paradigm that we've all embodied for the last 10,000 years uh, is deeply seated in all of our psyches, uh, even if we rationally realize that a lot of our thinking is wrong. Uh, it's still deeply embedded in our psyches, so it's it's not so easy to to shift paradigms. Shifting paradigms doesn't mean isn't a rational 
thing where you say like, oh yeah, I believe in this versus this. It's like, it's your operating system. It's how your brain works. And right now we've all been programmed with the civilization uh, paradigm as our uh, personal operating systems that our, that our uh, organisms uh, see and interact with the world by. And we have to intentionally, consciously reprogram our entire operating system, uh, which takes a long time and is very difficult. Uh, and I'm not sure it can be done in one generation. I think it takes multiple generations. So anyways, just some of the elements that are different in this new paradigm that we all have to, to, uh, to switch towards. Stop thinking in terms of simple systems, uh, but be, being comfortable with complex systems. You know, a, uh, a computer, you know, you might think is super complex, but it's actually a pretty simple system. Uh, an airplane is a pretty simple system. You have a blueprint for it. You got a whole bunch of parts. It's very complicated in how it's put together, but it's, it's, it's not complex. It's simple because one plus one equals two. All of the ingredients, all, all the parts, they go together and they work in a predetermined uh, uh, way that's predictable. Ecosystems don't work that way. One plus one doesn't equal two in an ecosystem. They're complex, so you have emergent properties. Uh, you have all these nonlinear interactions uh, like the alternative stable states. And, uh, and we've got to get our brains thinking that way we, and, and get rid of the like simple where we're asking for linear answers from A to B. How do I do this? What do I do here? Uh, it's not that simple in an ecosystem and as a, as a keystone species we've got to learn to think like a complex system, think non-linearly um, uh, where time is cyclical and not necessarily linear. Um, integrate versus segregate, we uh, uh, science, modern science in the civilization paradigm has become successful by segregating the world. You can, I like to think of the metaphor of fission versus fusion. We've, we were really good at fission. We're really good at uh, separating things and figuring out uh, how one thing works, but we're not, we're really, really bad at integrating, at putting it all together, at being able to see how whole systems operate. Um, that's going to be a, a, a real big challenge uh, to developing ecosystems. The paradigm of competition versus cooperation. A lot of this is pretty self-explanatory. For I'm sure people that are sitting here have already figured a lot of this stuff out. Here's a trade-off that a lot of people don't that confuse a lot. Um, efficiency versus resilience. These are two sides of a spectrum. You know, I see some people saying like we have an efficient, resilient system, and those those they don't they don't coexist very well. So if you have a system that's very efficient, it is by definition not very resilient. If you have a system that's super, super resilient, it is by definition not very efficient. What we're talking about with regenerative agriculture, you know, it's not as maybe not as resilient as a, as a full-blown evolved ecosystem, but it's way more efficient than a monoculture. And it may not be as efficient as a cornfield, but it's more efficient than, you know, uh, a, a more wild, less managed state. So we're trying to find a balance between efficiency and resilience. Um, but we've got to question whether efficiency is a good idea because every time we increase efficiency in one element of our operation, we're losing resilience. And sometimes you've got to do that in order to cash flow, in order to make money. You've got to be efficient. I mean, you've got to be efficient in a lot of ways, but we've got to be efficient uh, consciously and like know the trade-offs and make sure we don't become too efficient in certain aspects of our operation. I can give some more examples of this later, but this is a really, a really important point. <laughs> Uh, another difference here is an egocentric thinking about like okay I gotta I gotta maximize my my utility I've got to be comfortable I want I'm trying to like develop my career I'm trying to provide for my family is very egocentric uh, thinking about me uh, versus an ecocentric or kin centric uh, approach where we we realize that our uh, existence on this planet is completely dependent upon all the other species and members around us and so. If something's bad for the birds, it's bad for us. If something's bad for the worms, it's bad for us. And, 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 and feeling like uh, the system is what we're trying to uh, increase the well-being of and not just our own personal selves. And then another, uh, there's hundreds of these that I go, go through, but another one last one, uh, 
concept of design is really interesting because it's such a prominent part of the permaculture movement in terms of permaculture design. We teach permaculture design classes. Like, what does design mean? For a long time, design really is a synonym for blueprints. We have a or a recipe. So we have this is what you do. You're going to do this, 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 and this, and then this is going to be your outcome. Uh, one plus one equals two. And if you're talking about a complex ecosystem and managing a complex ecosystem, that does not work. You cannot walk into an ecosystem and then in, uh, inter, you know, uh, impose your design and then have a desired outcome because it's going to be unpredictable. There's going to be all these kind of things. You're trying to de develop a business plan. There's all kinds of things that go on that mean that this idea of design and then implementation uh, there are elements that we need to incorporate, but, but what's really important is having developing your own adaptive design process. So that design is something you're doing every day uh, that is informed by all of the flows and activities are going on around you in the landscape with the animals and the plants uh, and, and your own daily life flows and patterns. And it's not you sitting down at a computer with a nice pretty map, drawing nice pretty pictures, saying like, okay, this is my design, now I'm going to go do it. Like, yeah, you got to have maps, uh, you got to be able to communicate ideas, it's good to have plans, but I see a lot of people in the permaculture world putting way more emphasis on design, yet, you know, they may have this perfect design of their property, but they don't know what plants are there, you know, what kinds of trees are in that woodlot. If you don't, you, you need to know the answer to those questions if you want to have a good design. So anyway, uh, it's really important that design is a process of that never ends. It's always going on in a in a in a regenerative agricultural context, uh, not just something you do at the beginning and then and then follow. Okay, just a few slides here on uh, what I think it means uh, to become sort of a keystone species and and trying to redevelop these savanna ecosystems. Uh, here's me doing a couple things. Uh, to benefit our farm. We had a cornfield when we first got there, uh, planted the prairie grasses. So I'm out there right now uh, planting prairie plants, um, those C4 deep-rooted plants. And I've got, these are steep uh, sandy hillsides with really poor vegetation growth. So I'm feeding hay to the cattle up there, trying to get carbon back on those soils. These, this hillside, this was taken two and a half years ago. And this year, that hillside is way more green because I've been, this is my that's why I have I had two winners so far feeding hay up there, and it's made a huge uh, improvement. So, just a couple things. Uh, but here's a, here's a few points I think that's really important. If we want to become keystone species on our landscapes, we got we got we got to think about it this way. So, um, one thing is just knowing your plants. I don't have a slide for this. I'm just thinking about it now. But you got to know your plants. You, you should know all the all the things going on around you. But start with your plants. Know the trees. Know the shrubs. Know the grasses. Uh, and then it doesn't really matter like what you call them. You could call them whatever you want, but just so you recognize them as individuals, as different from everything else, so you can start seeing patterns of what species hang out together, uh, how they're dependent on one another. You start to learn the birds and how the birds, um, the bird populations change with different plant populations. Start to see all that. Uh, you got to start opening up your eyes. Uh, to that element of nature because uh, we've lost that. Human beings now, we're really good at noticing sort of like brands, like if I showed you like the Nike swoosh, you would all know Nike, but I could show you a picture of a, a dark-eyed junko and you probably wouldn't be able to tell me it's a dark-eyed junko. We need to be able to know the junkos. Um, so anyway, uh, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, I, I just think that's really important. So we got to manage vegetation. Uh, when a lot of ecologists, they're you know, trying to restore natural systems, so they're trying to remove humans from the landscape, you end up not managing vegetation, uh, and you end up with this wooded situation. If I let this pasture go, it's going to go through succession very rapidly. It's going to turn into forest. You can see in this picture, this is our, one of our valleys. It's surrounded by forest on all sides. The, the valley's been maintained grassland because the previous owners grazed it. Uh, and our job is to keep it going. I'm mowing thistle here, uh, which comes in and then the animals don't like to eat it, but then I mow it and then here's a picture a couple weeks later, all the animals are super happy because the, I opened up for the grasses and now all the grasses are in. But uh, what's, you know, what I think is a better, you know, at least we need to manage our vegetation, right? But what's better than managing vegetation with machinery 
uh, or with hand tools is using animals to manage our vegetation, cattle, sheep, goats. We don't have mastodons, unfortunately. We don't have ground sloths that are as big as a, a school bus. We just don't have those on the landscape anymore, so we do we use what we got. And what we've got access to right now is sheep and goats and pigs and cows and chickens and turkeys. Uh, we're hoping to add more soon, but we got a we got there's just, you know a lot of infrastructure needed to be able to do all this. So manage animals, manage vegetation. Um, all of you guys know this. You know we need to get fruit and nut trees and shrubs and vines and and forbs out on the landscape. Um, but what we need to do is beyond just planting and tending these trees is start to develop productive disease resistant good tasting uh, vibrant and locally adapted varieties of all of these plants and animals so uh, the selection and in plants and and livestock in the last hundred years has been all towards you know big things that store well uh, that you can grow efficiently in a monoculture uh, or for an, from an animal's perspective, things that grow big, that have high weaning weights, and that can finish large carcasses on corn, uh, at least for cattle. That's the, what cattle have been bred for. That's why we have different genetics, uh, brought genetics in from elsewhere. Um, but we've all got to engage in this process of evolution for the plants and the animals to get, we all need, all of our locales need to have locally adapted varieties of all these different species uh, that are, that are productive within a low management within you know we, we can't spray every apple tree we can't you know micromanage every plant like they do in a conventional monocultural setting so we've got to have genetics for a, a, a kind of a hybrid between a very productive sort of a efficient variety and, and a total wild type you know we need to have we need to develop these sort of intermediate uh, varieties so that we can uh, survive. We, we're we're going to need these things. Um, another thing I think is really important is the concept of sort of like uh, committing to a place and, 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 uh, and becoming a part of that place. Uh, it's really cosmopolitan. It's really popular uh, to travel a lot. It's culturally, uh, it's kind of a prestigious thing to be able to travel and, and to tell your friends all the places you've traveled. Oh, I just got back from Europe. Oh, I just spent my summer, you know, backpacking wherever. And that's great. I think traveling is awesome. I've enjoyed some uh, travel in my life, uh, and that has really opened up my perspective and made me see the world in more full ways, and I think traveling is great. However, I feel it's really important if we want to engage with these ecosystems that we've got to fully commit ourselves to a place uh, and fully uh, integrate ourselves with that place and be prepared to say, like, here I am. I'm going to be here. Uh, I'm not going to move to, you know, the the beaches in Spain, and I'm not going to move to the mountains in uh, um, Idaho or Wyoming. I'm I'm going to stay right here in Wisconsin. And I think once you've done that, it changes the way your brain works. It changes the way you think about yourself and the landscape. And you can start you start making inherently making decisions that are that are more forward. That are that are not just you know, decisions that you're where you're considering the impact over the short term time frame. Now you're thinking about like, okay, well, how is this going to impact the situation in, in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 100 years? Uh, and I think we all need to start thinking that way if we want to build build these ecosystems back up. Um, we're all pretty domesticated. Uh, we've been uh, pretty enculturated and domesticated for a long time. I tend to think of human beings today as like chihuahuas relative to our uh, ancestor wolves. Uh, and as chihuahuas, we're pretty uh, lame. Like we don't have skills and we don't have uh, uh, a, a lot of the strength and resolve and will and, and, and we seem to be kind of wussy. Uh, and I think we <laughs> if we're going to do these things, we've got to like buck up and kind of re rewild ourselves would be one way of thinking about it uh, in terms of our you know bodies and our gut flora and our diet and, and our clothing and our gait and the way we walk and the way we interact with the world uh, in a less uh, you know uh, domesticated way but in a more like human uh, in a more human way um, another element here um, there's a 
a Native American scientist in the Pacific Northwest named Enrique Salmon, and he has this idea of kin-centric ecology, where we um, we develop our ecosystems, we interact with the ecosystems, where we think of each element in those ecosystems as our family. Um, so it's not just me out on the farm with my immediate family, a wife and child. Uh, it's also the dogs and the cows and the birds and the worms. Um, we have a, an old 100-year-old ironwood tree right outside of our house. And in the winter, this is our third winter, and each winter there's been a, a cohort of birds that live in this tree, and they kind of fly around, and there's, a, there's basically pairs. There's a, a male and a female of a bunch of different species, and they're all friends, and they all hang out together. So there's a pair of downy woodpeckers and chickadees and nuthatches, dark-eyed juncos, and there's a pair of tufted titmouse. And uh, they're awesome, and they're super fun, and, you know, we get to see them flying around, and our, our year-and-a-half-year-old daughter gets to watch them fly around. We put out little jars of lard, and they eat the lard, and it's super fun. And then uh, just the other day, a, one of those birds flew into our root cellar. We had the door open, and uh, we have a little a live trap for mice in there, and we had some corn in the trap, and the bird got in there and got in the trap, and it died. And you know, these birds were like a part of our lives. And in any other time, it had just been like a bird, like whatever, right? You know, whatever. It's you know, there's thousands of birds, but like, you know, that was that wasn't just a bird. It was it was a bird whose uh, partner now was partnerless. <laughs> You know, a part of a small community. It was part of our family, and it, you know, it, we're, we've got to think about these communities, and it's not just us. It's it's the whole system, and we're all related. And it takes a village. None of it. We can't do this on our own. A lot of this is where I see a lot of uh, room for improvement. I think in the the permaculture and regen ag world figuring out ways of working together. Um, there's a lot of individuals out there doing things on the land that are very positive and very good, but we still have this sort of egocentric paradigm, and I think until we are able to, to sort of loosen our egos and get uh, into a more, more uh, ecocentric mindset, uh, it's going to be challenging. But I, I think going forward, we really need to figure out how to work together as human beings and as communities to uh, solve problems and to uh, you know, resolve these ecosystems. Uh, another factor that I think is is that we got to do is we all need to find out for ourselves what is important uh, and what is important to us. So, you know, in our journey, we uh, just moved out to the land with nothing. We lived in a tent, and then we put up a yurt that we built out of sticks, and then we got a mill and cut down the trees and pine trees, and we built a cabin out of that. That's where we're living now. We don't have running water. Uh, we just recently got internet down at the barn, which I would be there now, except uh, it's way too cold. The router wasn't even working. So uh, there's um, uh, we're we're at a point now in our lives where we've stripped away all of the modern conveniences that we had grown accustomed to, and that we'd sort of inherently taken for granted. Um, and now we're putting it all back together and building our lives uh, in a way that we want. Uh, and, you know, figuring out what is important, what of our lives is important. Like, we do want running water. We're going to get running water, but it was really important for us to have to carry our water every day to, like, to learn and internalize how important that is uh, and the various elements of our lives uh, that we have to figure out as important is really difficult when we live in a domesticated modern environment where we take everything for granted and, uh, I don't think everybody should go out and live off-grid with no resources, but even just going backpacking, I used to go backpacking, and I just loved it because you stripped down all the um, the stuff that you were, had taken for granted and that you're used to in your life, and you got to get to see the world from a whole different perspective, and I think that's really important. Uh, another element here, I kind of touched on this before, talking about complexity. It's really different. Uh, approach the world when you realize how little we know and uh, and how much uh, wisdom is in the landscape and not in our heads. Um, the you know science is great and they come up with all these kind of great technologies, but like a leaf on a plant is a superior technology to any computer that humanity has ever built or ever will build. Uh, it's a superior structure in every way. Uh, and sort of internalizing that wisdom and trying to connect to that is really important. Uh, 
uh, if we want to successfully integrate into these landscapes. It takes, it requires, in my opinion, the humility to admit that we don't know what's going on and then to try to figure out what to do, not from a position of like, oh, I'm smart, I took a PDC, I know how to design things, uh, but going from that perspective to like, okay, here's this landscape, it's infinitely connect complex, I'm here trying to become a part of it, like what does the landscape want, what do I want, and can we merge together to accomplish all of our goals? Um, and I think it's really important to get to that point uh, in order to get to that point, uh, to be able to admit that you don't know what's going on uh, is really important because that's when you start opening your eyes and actually seeing what's going on, uh, letting the landscape teach you what's going on, not you bringing your concepts to the landscape. Um, I think it helps to really clear your mind of all of, all of your concepts uh, occasionally and, and try to learn from what's going on around you. Um, and then we've got to learn how to think like our landscape. Um, this photo here, again, Aldo Leopold out in New Mexico wilderness, he was bow hunting. And this is a good example of a couple of the things I've been talking about. Um, several of you will have read and heard the story of uh, the Green Fire. Uh, so Leopold was working for the Forest Service in New Mexico and his job was basically killing wolves and it was sort of policy to kill the wolves and he thought he was doing the world a favor, the landscape a favor by killing the wolves because wolves eat the farmer's sheep and you know they're a threat and it's like humans or wolves and it's humans job I and mean, that's the paradigm that you know humans are the top predator we gotta get rid of the wolves and one day he killed a wolf and uh, looked into its eyes saw this fierce green fire and realized that um, well I'll just read it, I realized then, they've known ever since, that there was something new in those eyes, something, all, something known only to her in the mountain he was young and full of trigger itch he thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean a hunter's paradise. But after seeing the fire died, he sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. So realizing that sort of the mountain has a perspective, the landscape has intelligence, and it's our job to integrate with that intelligence and not impose our own concepts on it. What ends up happening in his context, uh, they killed a bunch of the wolves. Now the deer overpopulated and actually destroyed the vegetation there. Uh, and they had a, a, a crisis because there was no wolves. So he, he learned that you know, the, what the mountain wanted was the wolf and the wolf needed to be there but it needed to be in balance. And uh, another point here that I want to make uh, that I think this is a good example of, back to our paradigm shift slide, talking about the difference between egocentric and ecocentric. You know when you're Egocentric, it's really difficult to accept feedback. You know, it's one of the permaculture principles. You interact and you accept feedback and you redesign. Um, if we aren't open <laughs> to the situation and have a lot of stock in our own ideas, then it's really difficult to see, uh, to get that feedback. And so Aldo here dropped his ego down when he saw the, the, the green fire in that wolf's eyes uh, and realized that he was wrong. And it's really difficult to realize when we're wrong uh, but it's the most important and the most difficult but the most important thing we can do is be able to realize when we're wrong and then and then go and move on and learn from that perspective thinking like our landscape not bringing our concepts but, but thinking like the landscape and then in a even more material way we need to literally become our landscape. We need to eat the food that's growing around us, the nettles that pop up in the spring, the morels that pop up, the, the berries. Um, it was really cool. I was talking to an archaeologist at University of Wisconsin once, and we were talking about these, uh, we were talking about the sort of sequence of different tribes coming through the areas, and, um, and she was like, oh, well, this tribe was from this area of Wisconsin. I was like, well, how the heck could you possibly know that this, this group of people that you excavated in this one site was from a totally different place. So they, they had excavated like one lake up in northern Wisconsin and they were saying, well, no, these people weren't from there, they were from this area in southern Wisconsin. I was like, how do you know that? And she was like, oh, well, you know where somebody's from based on the, the composition of their bones. And I'm like, what? And she's like, oh yeah, well, you know, every place has its own unique mineral composition in the bedrock. And then if you live there and eat the food from that place, then your bones, uh, reflect the mineral composition of the underlying bedrock. And so you can tag, you can identify, if you dig up bones somewhere and you can look at the composition of minerals in those bones, you can say, oh yeah, this is where that person's from. 
Um, and that just kind of struck me as a pretty powerful thing uh, and how far we are from that now. Uh, we import and ship food all around the world, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but uh, I think becoming more of our landscape, actually like eating the food that grows around us is a really important factor. Okay. Oh, man, I need to drink a water. Um, that's kind of the end of the presentation. Uh, I have a few more slides to just give you kind of an overview of our farm and where we're at. Uh, maybe I'll try to check in with Neil here and see what do you think in terms of time. Should I keep going or should we go ahead and uh, stop for questions? I, would, I think if you keep going with it. Okay. It's just, uh, just yeah. a handful more slides. I just wanted to give people a, um, uh, a view of our farm and what we're doing. Um, and maybe, yeah, I, I, could, I could go in, you know, this could be another two-hour presentation here, but I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go through these super fast. Um, here is our farm. Uh, we've got 260 acres here. Uh, well, here, let me go show this picture. Okay, so this is where we are broadly. Uh, the Driftless region of southwest Wisconsin is this really special spot that the glaciers missed. So in every glaciation for the last three million years, the glaciers came down and a lot of them went all the way down and, and completely around us in all directions. But for some reason, nobody knows why, this area right here did not get penetrated by the glaciers. And so this would have been a refugia. It would have been really cold, but a place where some life could have kept in there. Uh, it's got the Mississippi River flowing through the middle of it. That might have had something to do with it as a buffer. And then where we're at, this is the Kickapoo River watershed here. Uh, this watershed here is considered the oldest river and the oldest watershed in the world. Uh, not sure how they know that or say that, but that's what they say, some geologists. Uh, and we're right here. Camp Creek is one of the main feeders into the Kickapoo River. It's a class one trout stream, so we have freshwater trout in our stream. And uh, yeah, that's where we are, upper Midwest, zone four. Um, there's the there's the farm, the Camp Creek trout stream coming in, the Kickapoo is right down here. So we're about 260 acres. Most uh, half of it is woods, steep wooded hillsides, and ridge tops. Here we've got one ridge field, but the majority of our pasture is uh, valley uh, and and these hillsides here. Um, and uh, you know it's interesting. You look at this photo uh, and you see, hey, it's about 50 percent wooded and 50 percent open like a savanna but it's not we've got areas that are 100 percent forest and 100 percent open so our goal and what we've been doing is planting trees in all these open areas you know we planted thousands of trees down here thousands of trees up here we're getting ready to do a big planting on this field down here and then we've been clearing out trees in the forest so we've got no savanna up until what we're creating so we're adding trees to the treeless pastures and we're massively removing trees from the woods. I mean cutting down thousands and thousands of trees trying to open up uh, area. It's a big job. It takes a lot of labor so it's going to be a slow, it's a lifelong project but uh, uh, there you have it. Uh, here's some aerial views of the valleys. Uh, really pretty. We've got a big old spring right here. That's what I'm drinking, the uh, spring water. It flows about 100 gallons a minute into the spring pond, which then flows into the trout stream. The trout actually um, have their, lay their eggs. Uh, they spawn right at the top of this creek here, right on our property. Um, the view from the ridge, it's really nice up there. Uh, it's a big project. It's the one spot on our, there's a big difference. There's about a 350 foot elevation difference between the valley down here and the ridge up top. So the climate's really different. Uh, the ridge stays warmer. Uh, in the fall and gets warmer early in the spring, the cool cool air pools down into the valleys. Uh, so we got completely different sort of microclimates. So it's an interesting design challenges for plants and all that kind of fun stuff. We have a lot of moisture, so it's this is a typical summer morning fog that doesn't lift until the sun comes out. Um, we built a little cabin uh, back up here in the valley. We got a bunch of dogs, uh, livestock guardian dogs. Uh, Here's a cornfield. Here's us sowing um, uh, the prairie seed in the cornfield, planting trees there, uh, all kinds of different trees. Oh, you can even see the hay bales from the year before uh, up on that hillside there. Uh, I've got a little old sawmill that we're using to cut the pines. There's an old pine plantation uh, that we're using to cut to 
build things. So here's the, the when we built a little timber frame is where we're living now. Um, out of that, let's see here. Here's a little view of the inside. Uh, it looks a little different than that now. That's an old picture. Uh, we eat really good. You know everything. We grow pretty much 100% of our food. Uh, in in terms of like what we raise, cattle is kind of the the big thing. We've got about 50 head right now. A mix of Red Devon uh, and Red Angus, uh, and uh, we uh, have cat. We have cows, and they have calves, and then we raise them for two years, and then we sell them as beef. Uh, we have more of a market than we have uh, the herd capacity for, so we do buy in steers as as calves, and then finish them out as well. Uh, we also do pigs, you know, 30 or so a year feeders. We don't have infrastructure set up right now for overwintering hogs. We do want to start breeding here at some point, uh, hopefully within the next couple of years. Uh, our, we have a cruise of sheep and goats that help us uh, clear out vegetation in the uh, woodlands that we're clearing out. Um, they help out a lot. They're a big help. They eat a lot. Uh, up until now, we've been running hair sheep. Uh, Katahdins, but we have recently switched. Um, I actually just went and picked up these guys a few days ago. Rambolet, it's a it's a fine wool sheep like merino. My wife's been getting into knitting big time, and uh, wool is really important for us because it's co so cold. And uh, the big factor that made us decide to, to go with wool sheep from here on out is that um, <clears throat> one of our neighbors has a uh, wool shop here in Viroqua, uh, she sells yarn, but she just opened up a wool mill just five miles from us where they can take buy raw mill and have all the machinery to wash it, cart it, and then spin it and make their own yarn. And so um, we are really excited about the, the the future of a kind of a fiber shed of being able to develop locally um, uh, sustainably raised wool and then local wool products. Um, so that's a really exciting things we've got going on now. And then our main economic engine is our um, meat CSA. So we run a, a meat CSA. Uh, it's monthly. We deliver straight to our customers in Madison and La Crosse, which is about an hour away. Uh, we People sign up for a monthly share of a set number of pounds of beef or pork or lamb or whatever mix they want, and then we bring it to them. And uh, it's, it's a really nice uh, fit for us and our family and our business on our farm because I'm only delivering once a month uh, and uh, we're able to capture all the value of the products we sell at retail prices um, and since we deliver to people's doors it's a lot easier than asking somebody to come to a drop site. Uh, people really like it. It works really well for us. We're really happy with it um, and that's our that's our cash flow that helps us sustain our livelihood. We um, yeah we've been there three years now and uh, in our tiny little cabin, it's about 16 by 16, so 250 square feet. Uh, here's a picture of the cabin uh, as we were building it. Um, so yeah, we're getting ready to start building a, a legitimate house here next summer. Uh, some other things we do, uh, we run a, a eight-day permaculture design course uh, focused on regenerative ag. Uh, folks like Grant Schultz, we attempt to mark Shepherd's Place. Um, uh, we'll have a variety of instructors this coming year. It's going to be in June, uh, June 17 to 25 this year. So we'll be right in the solstice week. It'll be a fun, a super fun week. I'm looking forward to that already. Uh, PDC, and then uh, yeah, right now we don't have. Uh, we've had a few interns in the past, but we're going to be opening it up this year, this season, hoping to bring on two or three uh, interns to help with the grazing uh, as part of like uh, part of the system um, and set up. We've done uh, sort of these um, uh, apprenticeships before where people start their own enterprises, broilers. We've done broilers that way, vegetables. The nice thing about having our CSA is we already have a customer base, so uh, we have a market. If we want to try developing a new product, say we want to start doing lard or we want to start doing vegetables, well, we we're already delivering to these people's houses. They, they love us. They love our food. Anything else that we grow, they are happy to to try out and support, so uh, it's a pretty neat system. Um, so that's pretty much all I had here. Um, if we want to go ahead and open up for questions, I'm I'm up for that. Yeah, man, Woo. that was amazing. That was amazing. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Peter. I, I think if everybody, if you got a lot out of that, let us know. Type in the chat box to say yay or one if you liked it. Let us know. Like that was mind blowing. I I love hearing about ecological history and especially seeing how you're applying it. I just I just yearn for to be back in environments like that. Okay, Emil is saying awesome stuff. Patrick says sweet. Allison says hell yes. Oh yeah, people are people are getting a lot out of it. Um, so before we go to the Q and A, I got a quick poll question for you. Is this your guys' first webinar? So ask that. Uh, answer away if if you can. Just let us know because it it helps us gauge whether it is or isn't. All right. So just going to leave that open for a few seconds. Cool. And we'll get to the Q&A. Um, I just wanted to jump in real quick here. Um, for all of you folks who are attending, who for this is your first one, looks like about 10 people, uh, we do a, we're do we doing a weekly webinar this year. We only did uh, 15 days. Um, for those of you who are who have attended a bunch, if you want to support, you know, Peter, Alan, or Richard, who was with us last week, or uh, McCoy, or come on to the webinar. Uh, when someone downloads our webinars. Man and uh, all of our speakers share in the revenues of that. So, by the more people that download this webinar in the future, the more money that we send here. Uh, and we've got that arrangement in perpetuity. So this is this is one way that we, as a sustainable design masterclass, can support. Peter's work, not just by showcasing what he's doing, but um, the more downloads we get, the more money we send him. Uh, and that's a way that we feel like we can. Sorry, sounds like there's some audio problems on Neil's end. Well, I don't like very fair share, but. Yeah, sorry, Neil. It sounds like you're getting the the robot voice from the connection breaking up. But I appreciate it. Yeah, like anyone who wants to support our work, you know. Okay. Well, how about let's uh, let's get to the Q and A, shall we? So, if you guys had questions during the presentation, come back in right now, and now you'll be able to get uh, Peter answer your questions. So, yeah, we're going to do a few questions, then, and then a bit later we're actually going to do, you'll be able to ask it in person. I can unmute a few of your guys' audio, and so you can ask them a question in person. But few, first, let's get to around 10 questions uh, from, from you guys. So first one is from Paul. Paul says, are you still managing your pigs in the same way, way keeping them out of the forest? Uh, pigs in the forest, yeah. Uh, at first, when we first brought pigs on, it's like, oh yeah, pigs in the woods, Joel Salatin, like, let's put pigs in the woods, except that at our place, the only places we have these woods, you can actually see in the, uh, those images, is on those really steep hillsides, and so, if you've ever been around a pig, the reason its nose is shaped the way it is, is because it's a plow, and it likes to dig, uh, and last thing you want to do on a steep hillside is dig it up uh, because then you lose your soil when it rains it washes away so um, because of that we're more constrained about where we put our pigs so we've got uh, several valleys with some woods in them so we have them on the flattest parts of our farm and we do them on rotations the cornfield that we took out was about five acres that we planted several thousand trees in uh, once those trees are more mature, that's going to be sort of our permanent pig paradise paddocks. Um, you know, planted mostly, most of those trees we planted were for the pigs. Uh, you know, oaks and hazelnuts and chestnuts and apples and mulberries. Uh, it'll be uh, largely for the pigs. 
uh, and until then we've got another rotation where uh, we would like to actually raise more pigs than we do, but we're because we have so little flat ground, the, there's another spot on the farm that we have available is up on the ridge top. It's fairly flat up there, except it's 350 feet above the spring, and so water is a big challenge. We're actually going to be putting in water infrastructure this year to hopefully uh, have a solar-powered pump that gets water up there. It's right on the line of like uh, distance to for the pump to actually be able to handle it. So it'll be interesting to see if it works or not. But um, uh, yeah, we because of the steepness of our wooded land, we really keep our pigs out of there. The only exception to that is in the fall when the acorns drop, we let the pigs run up on the hills uh, for uh, not permanently. Uh, you know, we don't just put them up in the oaks. We you know, have them down in the valley. We let them out. We bring them up to the oaks for the day. We bring them back at night to minimize the damage that they would otherwise cause to the steep. Uh, hillside sto soil, but um, but yeah, that's that's kind of where we're at in terms of where we manage our pigs. All right, awesome. Uh, and Peter, if if, if you want to go in there in here, and you can actually see all these questions were that have been asked. If you go down into the questions drop down bar, so you can take and answer questions at their own pace, or or I can read them out to you, whatever whatever you would want. Why don't you read them? Because it's going to be hard for me to like go through all of this stuff. Okay. You got it. Okay, Find so it. next question is from Joshua. Josh says, thanks for watching the great talk, Peter. I'm wondering what skills have you found most helpful in your Savannah conversion process slash farm? Or what skills might you wish you had better developed? It seems many farmers struggle with the financial business aspect of farming. Uh, yeah, I think the most important skills, like, uh, well, I guess if you, from a strictly skills perspective, I'd say, like, um, learning how to deal with animals uh, is the one of the most important things. If you want to have animals in the landscape, you know, you basically need to learn how to think like that animal. Uh, and so... When I'm with the cows, I'm trying to think like a cow. When I'm with the sheep, I'm trying to think like a sheep. And they think very differently. Uh, and so the approach to raising animals uh, is a, a skill that most people don't have, especially if you're coming from the city like me. Um, and, it, and it takes a while to develop that skill. And it just takes a lot of like hanging out with them, just like you know, spend three hours just sitting there hanging out with the cows and see what they do, how often do they drink, you know, like when does the calves nurse in their moms, like how do they interact with each other. Uh, is all important stuff. And uh, But then the end of the question there, bringing in the financial aspect of it, I think the most, for me, more important than like, you know, maximally being efficient with the business and maximizing profit and all that, um, farming is not a very uh, profitable place to be. Uh, it's one of the most depressed economies in the world, agricultural economy, whether you're conventional corn cropper or uh, regenerative grass-fed beef producer, um, the margins are very, very, very tight. So for us, what that means is, you know, learning to live with not much money. You know, like we are incredibly wealthy in all these sorts of ways. Uh, we live in a beautiful place. We have a beautiful family. We eat the best food in the world. But when I look at my bank account, uh, there ain't much there. <laughs> so learning how to, you know, uh, be happy with all of the non-monetary wealth that you can develop in your life and learning how to live in a modest income uh, and very mod you know, stripping down a lot of, uh, like I had that slide on like what's important, like figuring out what's important and focusing your energy there and um, being willing to like, you know, oh yeah, this book looks great on Amazon, it's only 25 bucks, like sure, I'll just throw it in my Amazon cart, like well, maybe it's not a good time to do that, maybe I should like hold back uh, and, and I think you know, a lot of us coming from the cities, we get jobs, you know, we have, you know, when I was in the city, I was making, as a, I was uh, teaching at the university, and I had a pretty decent income, and I didn't have to think about things too much, but uh, it's way different now, so to me, that's the, the biggest skill, uh, is just learning, figuring out what's important, and, and, and learning how to be happy, and live a good life without money, very much of it, just enough. All right, question from Christine. Uh, how hard of 
How have you been able to find hay or straw that hasn't been sprayed with persistent herbicides like Roundup? Um, well, Roundup is not often sprayed on hay crops um, because it kills grass, and uh, that's what it's targeted towards, uh, broadleaf plants. So um, I think that uh, it's not that hard to find hay that's not for us at least. Um, I've got three or four neighbors that I buy hay from. I talk to them. Like I, I drive by their fields. I know how they're managed. I'm happy with it. They're not certified organic, but they're not sprayed. Uh, some, if you're if you're talking like a dairy farmer uh, that's growing like like just 100% monocrop alfalfa, that's a different situation because they do spray those crops. But you know, a lot of grass hay, uh, which we're not a dairy, we don't need. Uh, you know, super high protein food, uh, hay in order to get maximum uh, milk production. Uh, we just need good hay. So uh, one thing is, you know, the hay is, uh, in terms of minerals, uh, it reflects the minerals of the subsoil in that place. So having hay from multiple places, I try to bring in different, uh, you know, from, from upland, like clay type soils and lowland sandy soils, uh, bringing in hay from different places, I think, helps um, in terms of having a more well-balanced diet for the animals. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, luckily our, a lot of our neighbors that grow hay don't spray, so it's, uh, it's pretty nice. Okay, question from Luke. What are your thoughts on creating permanent rotational paddocks versus portable fencing? He says he currently spends a fair amount of time setting up portable fencing to try to get out our animals in a forage and it seems like more permanent fence would be cheaper over the long term. Yeah, you and me both, man. <laughs> I spent many, many, many hours uh, moving portable fence, and I dream about the day when we have permanent uh, fences established all around our farm. I would love to just be able to go out and open up a gate, call the animals, run them through, close the gate. That's my job for the day. Um, I think it is... Uh, cheaper amortized over the long run um, but it's capital intensive up front so in our landscape you know putting in permanent fence paddocks on all uh, 200 something acres you're you know talking 20 30 40 thousand bucks minimum depending on how you do it what kind of fence you do so uh, it's a big capital uh, upfront cost but then the labor savings and then even material savings in the long run are worth it so we're in the process of laying those out um, and trying to figure out how to how to get the money together to, to do it. We'll probably we'll get a little bit of that done this year. We're, we're, we've got a really big NRCS contract um, for equi equip program for cost share, so we're going to get a lot of fence put in this year from them, but not the full thing. So, you know, it's going to be a, a many year process to get it all established. But I'm all for permanent paddocks. Um, you know, I, uh, it definitely increases the efficiency of your grazing system. It also, like I was talking about before with the efficiency resilience trade-off, um, one thing I really like about the temporary fencing is that every paddock is a little bit different every time. It's not always exactly in the same place. So there's little slivers where you can see like, well, this little sliver wasn't grazed in the spring grazing uh, this season, uh, whereas this one was. And you can kind of see the difference uh, you get a, a, a richer mosaic of grazed, ungrazed. You know, if you're grazing generally three, four, five rotations in the season, but you have little corners here and there that are kept out, it gives you an interesting window uh, into what's going on with your vegetation that you don't get if you are efficiently grazing every paddock uh, sort of at maximum time. So I like having those little windows. I've thought about ways of designing a permanent system, like maybe every... Um, every rotation leaving one or two paddocks out and just giving them a break from the grazing that rotation and seeing what happens. Um, so I think there's ways of maintaining the resilience and not totally maximizing your efficiency, but the labor efficiency of having permanent paddocks is like out of this world. Uh, and I, I am very much looking forward to the day when I'm not spending four hours a day moving fence around. Okay, quick. Uh, question from Amy, then we'll move to 
a live question. Then go back to these questions. But Amy asks, using pr native prairie grasses slash plants for grazing. Do you mix those with the cool season grasses, or do you have separate pastures for warm and cool seasons? Um, that's a good question. They're very different, um, warm and cool season grasses, and um, most every grassland you've ever seen is cool season. Any grazed pasture is cool season grass, and cool season grasses form a dense layer of sod, so they have really dense roots right on the surface of the soil. The you know top five inches is just completely saturated with those grass roots, and that makes it really difficult for a warm season grass to get established. So it's really hard to get warm season grasses established in a cool season pasture. Just frost seeding or interseeding is really difficult. Um, so that's why where we focused our prairie grasses was on the cornfield because we kind of had a blank slate. So we went in there and put the prairie grasses there before the cool season grasses came on. And so um, there will be a competition. Their cool seasons will come in. They already have started coming in. The seeds are there already. I'm not trying to maintain just cool, just warm season grasses, but I want to have warm season dominated pastures. Eventually, once we get more of our infrastructure set up, I think we can push things towards warm season. Um, one thing I learned from Greg Judy, uh, he'd been trying to get warm seasons established in his pastures and wasn't ha having any luck. He was seeding them, doing all this kind of stuff. We just couldn't get them to come up. But once he started pushing up his stock density, um, doing mob grazing, you know, 500,000 or a million pounds of animals per uh, acre, he started seeing warm seasons just come back. Uh, and not in areas that he planted them. So these were just native, the seeds were in the seed bank, the seeds can remain viable in the seed bank for decades or even perhaps 100 years. Uh, so it was in these areas where he was experimenting with a million pounds per acre stock density that all of a sudden he starts seeing these warm seasons pop up. Uh, so management is another factor. I, I don't have the ability yet in terms of infrastructure to be able to do a million pounds per acre, but we're going to get there. Uh, in which case I look forward to hopefully getting some natives just popping back up on their own because in, in the areas that haven't been plowed, that's a, certainly a possibility and I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. That's amazing. So running that much amount of, of animals like unlocked these species basically? Yeah so, yeah, so the European pasture grasses, the cool season the C3 grasses evolved for a long time they've been with domesticated cattle in a continuous grazing context. Continuous, continuous grazing and cool season grasses go together great. Cool season grasses are great and they're in all of our pastures because they can stand being continually grazed. They can be overgrazed just all year long, you know, one big paddock with a bunch of cows in it and they don't die, which is an amazing thing. So you're really abusing a grass plant when every time it grows a centimeter you're picking it off. Um, which is essentially what happens in a continuous grazing context. So that's how they evolved, and they're you know uh, good at that. The, I think what's going on in uh, Greg Judy's circumstance is that he's providing a, an environment that's much more like you know bison coming in, completely obliterating the vegetation, and then le leaving it alone. It's a big animal impact, and then rest is what those warm season grasses expect and want to see. So it's really interesting in prairie restorations because you know, this is something I did for many years, uh, uh, conventional ecological restorations. We're out restoring prairies. Well, you know, we don't want cattle there. We don't want livestock. So there's, there's no grazing. So you, you start this prairie. You go to a cornfield. You plant it. You've got 200 species of native grasses and flowers. Well, you start tracking those species over the years once you establish it, and the diversity goes down lockstep every year, and ecologists can't figure out why. Well, there's no animals impacting that site. So these warm season grasses, these prairie plants, expect to get obliterated every once in a while and then be let go. And that doesn't happen in a... So you have the opposite of conventional grazing, of continuous grazing. Instead of having continuous grazing, you have zero grazing. And, and both of those situations are bad for the warm season grasses, for the natives. They like the intermediate disturbance, the every once in a while having massive animal impact events, which then allows them to do their thing. So um, yeah, I think management has a lot to do with uh, what kind of plants you can have. If you have are doing any kind of continuous grazing, and you know a lot of what we're doing right now, we're doing rotational grazing, but 
it's, it's not the mob grazing where I want it to be. It's closer to continual grazing than I would like it to be, but it's what we can do within the constraints that we've got in terms of infrastructure. Um, as we develop more fencing and get a lot more fencing put on, then we'll be able to tighten things up, get, you know, daily or sub-daily moves going. Right now, it's like, you know, two or three days uh, between moves, depending on the size of the paddock, and, um, you know, that, that makes a difference in what kind of species like it there, and I'm uh, really looking forward to, to tightening those rotations and getting a context where more uh, more natives can can persist. Awesome. So here we go. We're doing our first live call-in question. This is going to be from Chef Seth, the permaculture chef, Peterson. Hey. So I'm going to unmute Seth real quick. Let's see if he's there. Hey, Seth, are you there? Let's see. Yo, yeah, Seth, can you uh, do you have an do you have the mic on you? If not, we'll go to another question real quick. Um, all right, sorry, Seth. We'll we can try that later. Sorry, Seth. <laughs> He's got a question, but I'll let him ask later. Uh, so, a question from Sandra. Sandra asks, "What wild animals are coming into the land, and how are they interacting with the changes you've been making? Also, have have any pioneer savanna plants been coming into your clearings?" Um. Yeah, uh, that last question there. Some uh, savanna plants, native plants, have been popping up in our clearings, although I think what's really going to bring that on is when we clear out enough at a large enough scale that we can actually burn. I'm not a big fan of using fire. I, uh, it oxidizes carbon and puts it in the atmosphere, which I don't think we need much more of, but um, a lot of the natives expect to be burned every once in a while, and a lot of their seeds need to have that fire in order to sprout, and so I'm really excited about Clearing Right now, if we try to have a burn, we're going to have a forest fire because we've got so much fuel and brush in there. But once we clear that out, we can have light understory fires. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of natives popping up. And the other, the beginning question about the uh, wildlife, uh, we definitely us moving into this valley has shifted all of the wildlife patterns. Um, kind of where we built our house is, had been sort of the mecca of deer hunting uh, in our area. Um, it's where a bunch of valleys come together and uh, former owners had big hunting parties and they'd have one, they'd draw straws and, and, and the person with the big straw got to sit in the stand at the bottom of the hill, which is actually right where our cabin is, uh, and then everybody else would go walk around the hilltops and push the deer down into that valley uh, and then it's, you know, then it's just a, you know, a real easy shot and they used to actually decapitate the deer, the bucks, and then hang them up in the the apple trees. We have an apple tree with like 40 uh, <laughs> deer antler uh, skulls in it, which is interesting. Uh, so anyway, but us moving there, you know, we've got three dogs that are running around all over the place. They've definitely shifted all that around. Deer do not come into our valley hardly ever. They stay up on the ridges. Um, the dog dogs chase them if they get close. So that's been a good thing for us because deer eat baby trees. And we've been planting thousands of baby trees. So uh, the dogs are a big help with that. Uh, but that's shifted those wildlife populations. Coyotes also have been pushed out of the valley. Uh, when we first moved here, there was the coyotes were uh, sleeping in the winter inside our barn. There were just like coyote poop everywhere. Uh, that's definitely changed since we've moved. Uh, you know, our dogs have taken over the job of being the of the canine in the valley. So uh, the coyotes don't come anywhere near our place. If they do, Odom, the dog uh, in that first picture, he attacks them. He's actually attacked a few. Um, so they kind of stopped doing that, uh, which is good for us because we got baby lambs and chickens and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I don't think we've displaced any uh, natives. I don't think, you know, there's plenty of habitat around us for them. Um, we've just changed their patterns on the landscape a little bit. Um, I think there are larger predators out there. There's been sightings of cougar nearby. There's been bears nearby, and there's been... Um, I don't know, I'm, nobody, I've, I've never talked to anybody that's seen a wolf, but we've had um, massacres of chickens in ways that I can't imagine is anything but a wolf with uh, leaving prints, paw prints that are like three times the size of my dog, and my dog weighs 100 pounds. Um, so anyway, uh, maybe we got wolves, maybe not. Uh, we've got 700 acres of uh, 
not used kind of abandoned land next to us that's actually for sale if anybody's got 2.2 million uh, wants an excellent project we got 700 acres literally right next door beautiful virgin awesome land but uh, it's a big place with no people and no animals no domestic animals so uh, it's a refuge for large animals if that's where the cougar was spotted so anyway um, we're just kind of in the middle of it I think we uh, we and our dogs influence the little path that we walk between our car and the house and right around our house but for the most part in the broader 200 and plus acres that we own is not you know we're not it you know haven't changed that much there's still lots of deer um, everywhere we have, we've got a lot of deer so um, yeah good question all right so the question from Seth was so if ecosystems remain stable till they flip to another state due to, envi due to environmental pressures, what does that say about the rate of climate change and how fast it will change? Uh, boy, that's a big question. That's a big I, question, yeah. Good question. I mean, I'm not going to pretend to like be an expert. <laughs> you know everything. I'll tell you the answer to it, but uh, my, my take on it is that, uh, you know, these flips, these catastrophic transitions between states are usually pretty fast. They happen fast. So you've got one stable state and then it, and then it flips. Uh, and it flips really fast. I expect the flip, uh, you know, it's, it's all about when the Arctic thaws out. When the Arctic thaws, I think that's going to send things into overdrive and it's going to flip relatively fast. But with climate, fast, you know, 100 years is like nothing. So, you know, fast or slow depends on your perspective. I think it's going to take a while. Uh, and I think it's going to be um, catastrophic. I think uh, the the when you know when you when you want to project into the future, often you look back into the past to see how things have uh, played out in the past. So if you look that the last time we've had a flip between systems was the the end of the last ice age, um, ten thousand years ago, and there was a period of a thousand years actually a little bit more than that, about 1,500 years, called the Younger Dryas, which was just crazy. I mean, it was all over the map. It'd get really hot and then really cold, and it would be drought, and it would be uh, uh, floods, and it would be hot and cold and drought and floods. For literally 1,000, 1,500 years, it was, like, hard to live on Earth, and the population of the planet actually plummeted during this period. Um, it was really hard to grow grains. It was hard to do lots of things. What, em what emerged out of that is civilization as we know it. Uh, once the climate uh, cooled down and, and calmed down to a more predictable pace, now we're at the beginning of another shift. And is that shift going to take 20 years to play out or 2,000 years? I have no idea. I hope it's less, but you know, we got to be prepared for the worst, I guess. Good question, Seth. Good, good answer too. That's that's good. It's it's a hard question to answer. A Andrew says, uh, in a follow up question, he says, "What what plant species are you putting in to adapt to potential changes in temperature and climate and climate?" Yeah, that's something I think about a lot. Um, you know, in terms of strategies for um, uh, mitigating the worst of of an of a uncertain climate future. I mean, definitely planting outside the climate zone. Uh, the challenge is, is that I think it's going to get really warm uh, here in the future. I think we're going to have less severe winters. I think it's going the average temperature is going to increase in most seasons. So you would think like, oh, yeah, you should plant. Like, we're zone four. Like, I should plant five, six, seven. The challenge is that um, while the average is going to be going up, my guess is that the average is going to go up because of the destabilizing Arctic, like what we're having right now, these polar vortex events where the cold air mass in the Arctic, instead of being stable there and maybe expanding out to make get it really cold here, which is not up abnormal, you know, 20 below here is not abnormal. Um, what's abnormal is that when it's 20 below here, it's 50, 60 degrees Fahrenheit in the North Pole, uh, and the ice is melting in December. That's very abnormal. And so uh, as that air system as that Arctic system destabilizes, I think we're going to have an increase in average temperatures, but I also think we're going to have an increase in these freak polar vortex events, which means we may get 20, 30, 40 below. Right now we're zone four. It shouldn't get more than 30 below, but maybe we'll get 35 below. Our low on Monday night coming up is 25 below. Now what's that going to do with wind chills? Could it actually dip down lower than that? If it does, that's going to 
really crunch our zone for species. I mean, we might lose some. So, um, so yeah, I think going both directions is smart. Uh, and I think, um, you know, not relying, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, not relying on one thing, but having lots of things, but, uh, you know, wh which direction it's going to go. I think it's just going to get more extreme in all, in all dimensions. It's going to get more extreme, more flooding. We had the worst floods in hundreds of years here this year, um, and worst droughts. So we had a, the worst drought in a hundred years was four, four years ago. Um, and I, I'm just going to try to get used to that, and which means you know water having irrigation systems set up so I can maintain pasture because that our stocking levels right now we're kind of at the upper ends of what our farm can support on a good year. So if we have another drought year, I need to call animals, or we've got abundant water resources in terms of springs and streams here. If I can develop a infrastructure, lay out the pipes and, and everything so I can irrigate, well then you know we're a lot more resilient because our income is based on our animal products, so that's for our cash flow and our family and everything, that's what we got to prioritize. Uh, and then plants are, you know, whatever we can can work within that context. And I think planting, you know, we're going to be planting like zone two, zone three honeyberries, uh, something that's definitely going to survive whatever polar vortex comes. But then, you know, I've been planting some pawpaws and persimmons, zone five, zone six stuff. Probably not going to make it, but it's fun to, fun, fun to play around. I, I, I love your answers to those. This is so cool. So cool hearing about practical rewilding and adaptation to extremes. Okay, so now we're going to open it up. Uh, we're going to take a live question from someone, so we're going to unmute someone's mic here. So if you want to have uh, to ask a live question and get your mic unmuted, type in the, the question box, because otherwise I'm just going to pick someone who is who came to the farm scale permaculture workshop with uh, with Peter and that was with Peter and Neil and Grant earlier in the year. Let's see. Okay, how about I'm gonna try to unmute Curtis. Curtis is here. Curtis Brown. He's a farmer up in in Canada. Oh, he's not connected to audio. So I'll I'll, I'll see who wants to be unmuted. So Paul, you got Eric Huggins hand up. Okay, Eric Huggins. Paul is pretty adamant, so I'm going to unmute Paul here real quick. Let me just find him up in the names. All right, Paul. Uh, yeah, I'm going to unmute you. Just remember, if you have a question, uh, try to keep it short and simple because we got uh, a few more questions to go. Okay, here you go, Paul. You're on live. All right, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you great. Yeah. Okay, great. Hey, Peter, uh, it's been a couple of years. Yeah, man, good to hear from you. Good to, good to hear you, too. And uh, uh, my question was about um, the root sloth pit on grasses. I've been uh, reading some things that that's, you know, questionable whether how that's how and why or if that's happening and if you have any comments on that. And, um, thanks yeah. again for, for everything. Uh, in your presentation, it's always always great to hear you. Cool, thanks, Paul. That's a great question. Uh, yeah, there's been uh, differing opinions on the concept of root sloughing. Uh, you know, grasses say if they're grazed. The the traditional uh, understanding was that is that uh, basically what's going on below ground is a mirror of what's going on above ground. So you've got a, the the above ground plant system and then the root system that roughly mirrors that below ground. And if you coppice a uh, grass plant or a tree, then it sloughs off a lot of those roots, roots in response underground, which is just basically all that biomass is then food for microbes that converts that into uh, uh, soil organic matter, putting carbon in the soil. Uh, now there's been some research saying that, well, some plants don't do that, um, and I think that's really for sure the case, mm -hmm. that they don't always do it all the time. I think they definitely do it sometimes. I've got lots of observational experience just watching what happens to plants. One one example, uh, coppicing a, uh, in that, I just mentioned the, the worst drought we'd had in 50 years, or 100 years, uh, four years ago. Uh, during that drought, we ran out of grass, so I was coppicing black locust trees uh, for the cattle to eat. And a month after I did that, there was an explosion of grass growth, 
and there still hadn't been any rain. There hadn't been any rain in six months, and it was an mm -hmm. explosion of grass growth. So what's going on there is that when I coppice those trees, I was not planning on doing this. This was not on my intention. All I wanted was leaves for the cows to eat. But what happened was those roots sloughed off a whole bunch of water, and, and it's a legume, so it's a nitrogen fixer, also nitrogen. So now there's all this water and nitrogen in the soil, and the grasses respond. Uh, at least that's the story that makes sense to me. Everything that goes on below ground, like, we don't know. And if we look, then we destroy whatever process is going on so we can see sort of like the remnants, like the, like science works by killing things. Like you can't understand how anatomy works without digging in to a frog. You can't dig into a frog without killing it. So, you know, science works by looking at dead things. Um, in order to, under, to see what's going on below ground, we've got to go in there and dig it up and basically sever all those relationships. We can't see it. Uh, so we gotta do the best we can in terms of understanding it. I think that there's m many mechanisms that grassland communities use to sequester carbon in the soil. Root sloughing is one of them. But another thing that's not questioned is the uh, uh, the process of exudation. So roots are constantly pushing out sugar water, uh, water that's full of carbon, for the microbes to eat. Which then, in response, the microbes provide often like mycorrhizal fungus, providing minerals from the soil that's harder for the plants to access, providing them to those plants in exchange for that sugar water, which the microbes or fungus then turn back into soil carbon. Uh, and then the other mechanism is top. So those are all bottom-up ways to create soil. Then the top-down way is just through trampling uh, and incorporation of biomass above ground onto the surface, which then gets eaten. Now a lot of that does get oxidized, so the carbon balance is a little um, less one-sided than the below ground process where it's basically all that carbon is going back into soil if it's below ground. If it's on the surface of the ground, some of it's going to oxidize back into the atmosphere, some of it's going to get pulled down by worms and eaten by microbes and then going back into the soil. So there's lots of mechanisms for uh, getting carbon from the atmosphere into the soil through plants and animals. Now, we don't know how much roots slough off and turn into soil organic matter in rotational grazing. Uh, some people claim it's a lot. Some people are saying, hey, maybe it might not be that much. What we do know is looking back at the creation of the grassland soils, the slides that I showed about the evolution of the horses and the teeth, and like all of a sudden there's no, it's all subsoil, and then boom, you've got topsoil. That only happens in grassland ecosystems combined with large populations of grazing animals. The coevolution, the, the working together of grazing animals and grasses produces topsoil. Big, big horizons of deep, deep topsoil over periods of time of grazing. So whatever the mechanism is, whether it's sloughing or exudations or hoof trampling or whatever, um, whatever the mechanism, we know that gra grasslands and grazers together create topsoil. And whatever you think about climate change, whatever you think about the more mechanistic details of it, sort of doesn't matter. Because to me, like, yeah, climate change is a big deal. I want to lower the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, but what I really want to do is create soil. <laughs> you know, we our civilization has destroyed the soil, and on top of everything, uh, a fringe benefit of of recreating the soil is lowering the CO2 in the atmosphere. That's great. But what we need to do, and what we can all agree on, no matter what our politics is, is that we need to recreate the soil that our civilizations have uh, lost over the last 10,000 years. So, um, and we know that graze, grasses and grazers combined together in, in uh, holistically managed landscapes do that. And so let's give it a shot. Let's go do it. Awesome. Thanks for that question, Paul. Let's see. I'm going to uh, mute you real quick. Uh, let's see. So another question, good question from Keegan. I think I'll find it. Keegan says, I'm curious if you had any standout plant associations that you, that you've noticed are working really well together on your site. Associations you'd recommend in your experience. Hmm. So plant associations. I'm assuming you mean sort of like groups of plants working together, uh, like yeah, a guild. Guild in permaculture. Um, I get a little frustrated when I see people talking about guilds in permaculture because uh, it seems like people want to like design things. Uh, and what I'm really excited about isn't 
sitting down and trying to design the perfect grouping of plants together, but looking at the site and seeing what's there and what's around. So the first thing I do when you know somebody hires me to come consult or whatever, do a site visit, is just look at what's there. And there are communities of plants that hang out together uh, that are, you know, change from region to region. Uh, but in the Midwest, in roughly temperate areas uh, in this part of the country with decent soil that haven't been abused too much, uh, we get, the, I mean, the, the ultimate association in my mind is oaks, hazelnuts, apples, mulberries, hawthorn. Those are BFFs, they're best friends, and they're together on a landscape with appropriate animals. Uh, and they evolve together with animals. And the, the key piece of this, which is kind of interesting, is the role of the hawthorn, uh, which is a you know spiny, prickly, thorny plant. When right now, that function is being fulfilled on our landscape more by, say, multiflora rose, uh, quote-unquote invasive species. But when you've got a landscape that's dominated with grazing animals. You, when you think about it, it's like, well, pretty soon, aren't the animals just going to eat all the plants uh, and, and cause damage to those plant communities? And that's a definite thing. And hardwoods, oaks, all the animals love little baby oaks. They love little baby apple trees. They love little baby uh, um, prunus or uh, 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 plum trees. Uh, they love those leaves. All the animals do. And so if you're trying to regenerate a landscape that's got all this stuff growing wild, like black cherry is another member of that community that's always there. You can you can substitute maybe like a, a sour cherry or a Montmorency in there. But the animals love to eat it. So how does it regenerate in a wild context? Uh, historically, how did we have apple trees that made it with all the megafauna around? Because there's such high quality leaves. Same with mulberry. Well, because we have all these prickly plants around. So here we've got prickly ash. Uh, we've got uh, hawthorn, we've got multiflora rose, and these are plants that grow, and we don't like them as ecologists or as farmers because they're taking away land from that could be productive pasture, then the, the cows aren't eating it. Um, but what happens in those places is that's where the oaks regenerate, that's where the apples regenerate. Um, and so I think that's an important element that a lot of people don't think about in terms of these associations is the this prickly element that, you know, if you're planting and you're protecting with fencing or whatever or tree guards, uh, you may not need the prickly element for the regeneration of the hardwoods or whatever trees you want to grow there, that's fine. The other element we got to remember too is that all of these plant associations evolved also with the animal associations. So um, the animals evolved with hawthorn around all the time because if the hawthorn wasn't around, the oak wouldn't be around. So um, there's health implications as well. So hawthorn is an amazing medicinal plant for all mammals, uh, but especially livestock. And uh, it's an important part of a well-rounded diet for a bovine uh, or um, a small ruminant. So, um, you know, looking at the, the natural associations that are already present in a place and then designing your system off of that. And a lot of, a lot of the times that means you designing your system means like letting go and being like, oh man, I've got, you know, I learned this lesson our first year on the farm because I, first thing I did, we bought the land in the winter, so I hadn't been there for a growing season, and I put in a thousand mulberry trees. <laughs> Lots of mulberry trees, those mulberry trees. Okay, that's great. They worked, they started coming up, and then all of a sudden it's like, man, what are the, all these other trees popping up in my rows of mulberry trees? It's like, oh, they're mulberries. So I had literally hundreds of mulberries sprouting in the spaces between the mulberry trees that I planted. Now, that's not a very smart thing to do. If I had known those mulberries were coming, I wouldn't spend the money, the time, planting by hand, put all these little mulberries in there when I've got, you know, you plant a bare root tree and it's got its taproot trim. So uh, that's not a good situation relative to something that's native. It's already there. It's in the ground. It's locally adapted. Um, way superior to have a tree grow up on its own. I was consulting for a guy who had a horse pasture and he wanted to plant apple trees in it for shade uh, and apples and I was like okay that's cool and we're walking around and there's freaking apple trees sprouting up in this pasture and I'm like well let's just put like covers on these guys and here's your apple trees are already there we don't need to go plant them so a lot of times nature is pretty amazing and it's got pretty cool stuff around us we just gotta like and that's that's why like knowing your plants is so important you go into a place and you can see like oh yeah I've already got walnuts here I've got oaks here. I've got hazelnuts here. Uh, maybe you don't want that specific 
uh, variety. Maybe you want to plant a better variety for production, but um, knowing that is really important. So uh, looking holistically at the associations and thinking about the non-traditional things like the thorinies that we would normally not think about for a production system, except that they have major benefits not just for the regeneration of the hardwoods, but also for uh, health for the animals involved and for us. I eat uh, multiflora rose hips every day in the winter. All right, awesome. Uh, we're we're going to definitely go through a few more questions, but I need to take a second and show you guys. For for those of you who was this was your first webinar, uh, you can sign up for more at our site, SustainableDesignMasterclass.com. Now every you can sign up. You know we got free free weekly webinars. For this webinar, we're gonna do uh, we're gonna send you all a replay out that you'll have access to to Tuesday morning or Monday night, whatever. And then any replay that you guys buy from us, it it helps us pay more presenters like they have having Peter on, and it helps us just generally have enough money to manage our software so we can keep running this. But again, we thank you guys all for tuning in. It really, it really means a lot for us to have you all here. And for those of you who want to learn about more about Peter's farm, you can visit it at mastodonvalleyfarm.com. Oh man, I wish I was in Wisconsin because I would buy the heck out of those meat chairs. So how about let's get back to Q and A, shall we? Okay, so question from. Eric, he Eric says, pigs in the woods. Do you protect wanted trees or bushes? I'm thinking about setting up hazel in a pig pasture area. Um, yeah, and since we um, basically any area that one animal is in, most animals go through there. So um, yeah, we got pigs, but we'll also throw run our sheep through there. The cattle will run through there. So we do protect. The trees and shrubs that we want, um, you know, if there's either stuff that we're planting or stuff that's coming up wild. I mean, we've got uh, apple trees popping up all over the place, uh, so we're throwing uh, fencing around that um, to keep the goats and sheep uh, that would otherwise, even in a quick rotation setting, would quickly defoliate those trees. We protect them. Um, with if you're just talking about pigs, protection is a little less of an issue. Uh, pigs don't often like root up a tree uh, they will eventually but if you're rotating them relatively quickly I've run pigs through areas with baby trees in them and they have not harmed them now I'm sure if I left them there for a month uh, you know if you've worked with pigs if you leave them in an area for very long they quickly uh, uh, kind of destroy that landscape they really flip the sod over and compact it down eventually so um, that wouldn't be good for baby trees. You definitely want to protect them. But if you're rotating rapidly, uh, you might be able to get away with minimal protection. Uh, at the very least, running them, you know, planting your trees right on the outside of your paddocks or whatever. All right. Awesome. Okay. Well, I guess we're getting towards the end of of the Q and A. This has been a mind blowing webinar so far. Really, very. An awesome webinar. Next week, uh, we have a, a super related one. This is going to be mind blowing. This is going to be amazing. We're going to have John Liu on next week. He's going to be talking about uh, large scale ecosystem restoration. And so that's going to be definitely one that, if you really like what Peter's talking about, you definitely should not miss what John's going to talk about because he's going to be presenting a video from his 20 years of capturing ecosystem restoration on large scales and showing he's launching something called Ecosystem Restoration Cooperative and hopefully for those who want to be involved they can help out John with that too. Okay. Um, yeah, Peter, do you want to keep going with questions? How, how, are, you, how are you feeling right now? Yeah, uh, I'm going to take a quick uh, bathroom break but uh, I'll answer some more questions in just a second. Okay, cool. Yeah, bathroom break. Yeah, I don't know if Neil's still on here too. Neil's back. Yeah, I'm on. Is my audio still wonky? Uh, it sounds good right now. I don't, I don't know why it was. It went into robot mode earlier, but it sounds good at the moment. It's it's 12:20 a.m. here, so I suspect Ooh. the bandwidth consumption is in the neighborhood is dropping down. Okay. That's my guess. 
but I did have some warnings that it was going to be pretty bad when I was when I was getting on. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I I I love this. I love how high level it is. Like there are so many assumptions in what Peter's talking about that aren't intuitive for a bunch of folks. Um, I, I love that the first thing that Peter, I'm I'm talking about you while you were gone. The first yeah. thing that you looked at when you when you talked about where you are was the first thing you said was this is our, the history of our place and this is our watershed. Like you weren't like we're in Wisconsin. You said here's the watershed we're in, and here's the history of the Driftless region. I, I just love the approach there, where it's not. Uh, like there's so many assumptions in the idea of, hey, if I'm going to tell you about where I am, here's what my watershed looks like. Uh, it, it's not a typical kind of thing, but it's it's needed. It's needed. Anyhow, keep going with the questions. I'm still here. I'll talk after the questions are over too. Okay, next question is, let's see, where's the... Oh, here we go. Question from Antonio. Tony asks, would you apply some sort of booster like compost tea or ferments or compost for the plants at the beginning of their of your restoration process? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that obviously depends on like what you're planning into. Um, but if you're like in our situation, well, it, in one of our situations, you know, planting into a cornfield that's been continuously cropped for, you know, over a hundred years and has been round up every year for you know at least 10 maybe 20 years um, we you know there's no soil biology so any boost you can give to that soil biology uh, a couple cheap and easy strategies are like mycorrhizal dips that you can buy uh, when you're planting trees to uh, inoculate the, uh, the roots uh, the areas around the roots and water um, uh, the powder uh, that has mycorrhizal fungus in it that you can uh, mix into water and then dip your plant roots into that before you plant. Uh, I think compost tea uh, is a great thing. I mean, there's lots of things you can do. Compost tea, we just add compost directly. We, um, you know, we generate a lot of compost with our animals, uh, big piles, and then we, you know, mix that into our, um, the mix that we put down when we're planting a tree. Um, you know, we also uh, use like biochar. We, as when we're clearing brush out of the woods, we make big piles and burn them, and then then put out the fire before it burns completely. And then you get a big pile of uh, charcoal, which will then mix in with a compost pile uh, and, and have some sort of more live, active charcoal. Um, you know what else? Yeah, compost tea spray is great. I don't have a compost tea uh, system designed or made up uh, or spraying system. Uh, so I haven't used that, but I think it's a great thing to do. Anything you can do to boost soil life. Uh, wood chips to bring in more fungal uh, species is a great thing to do, although, you know, there's some trade-offs in terms of, like, bowl damage. The people that I see putting down a whole bunch of wood chips end up usually losing a lot to voles. I haven't lost any to voles because I haven't done wood chips yet. So, um, you know, I think there's trade-offs and good things and bad things, but I think, you know, uh, I like the shotgun approach of just getting as many... Uh, microbes and as many life uh, things going on in your in, in your dead soil and then getting it boosted as quickly as possible. One thing that's worked well for us, not for trees, but for pasture region in these really crappy cornfields, is running broilers through. Uh, and yeah, you're you're importing uh, grain, so we buy you know local uh, organic grain and we feed it to our birds. But it's amazing how the vegetation responds and how quickly it responds. Uh, following broilers running through uh, in chicken tractors is pretty impressive. So that's another thing to kind of boost, uh, give give degraded land a boost. Um, but yeah, any, anything you can do to get more microbes into dead soil, especially when you're planting trees, is is going to help. Nice. So a question from Liz: Do you let your animals roam together, or follow each other in rotation, or keep them in separate pastures? Uh, all of the above. Um, we don't do just one thing at all. There's so many factors that play into the rotation when and where, uh, you know, that uh, we don't just do one thing. So there have been times where I've put everybody into one big mob together. 
Um, because we run pigs and the pigs eat grain, that's not a great thing to do because once the other animals learn what grain is, then they want it too. Uh, and if you're doing grass-fed beef and lamb like we do, uh, you guys, you don't want those guys eating grain. So putting them with pigs is kind of tough. So generally, we'll keep our pigs and our um, like chickens because they also eat grain. They can kind of go closer together. Um, and then the sheep, goats, and cows are a little more complementary. In our specific context, you know, we've got all these broad valley pastures and then steep wooded hillsides. The steep wooded hillsides we're trying to clear out, and that's the sheep and goats' jobs. So we typically have them up there and the cows in the pure pastures, although we also run our cows up into those wooded hillsides uh, because there's a lot of food that they like to eat up there, especially a lot of medicinals that grow in those more wooded areas. Uh, so like pregnant moms, you'll see go, go on a mission straight uphill and start eating weird herbs uh, that they would never eat any other time because they're trying to, you know, uh, get a, a new mineral or, or whatever to uh, for their upcoming birth. So um, uh, there's not a simple answer to that question. I think uh, once we have, per like we were talking earlier about permanent paddocks, it'll be a lot easier to do like a leader follower type system. But right now, you know, all the animals require slightly different fencing. So if I'm just doing cows, like I'm fine on a single strand of poly wire. If I'm just doing pigs, I'm usually fine on a single or maybe double strand of poly wire low. Uh, but that ain't going to work for sheep and goats. So if I have sheep and goats anywhere near them, I need something much more beefy, which I use electric netting for. So uh, now, you know, I'm setting up a pig paddock, but then the cows are going to come by, and the cows can just walk right over the pig fence. And now I'm using uh, netting for a lot more uh, for pigs and sheep and goats just because it, it works for everybody. So I don't have to worry about the cows stepping over the pig fence to eat their grain. I got a net between them, and the cows aren't going to cross it. Um, so, yeah, good question. All right. So I have a, we'll have a lot more time for uh, questions after we're done recording. But, Neil, are you still there? Do you want to close this out? Because we might stop the recording session and just kind of hang out afterwards. And yeah, let's do that. Answer some of the questions we've done before. Okay, uh, Neil, I'll let you close it on out. Okay. All right. Let me jump on here so I'm yeah. not just a voice. <laughs> there we well, go. The voice of Neil. Um, first off, uh, Peter, we want to thank you for coming on. Uh, I think the knowledge that you share is crucial, um, and the example that you're providing is maybe more important than the knowledge. Uh, and to everybody who's attended with us, uh, we're so thankful that you're willing to give us your time. Uh, so thankful to those of you who are sharing our webinars with others and, and uh, downloading them. It, uh, it, it gives us the motivation to keep going, and uh, eventually we're hoping that it's going to give us the funds to be able to bring more and more people on and, and keep going in a, in a stronger way. So thanks to all of you. Uh, this is Sustainable Design Masterclass. So have a good week, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.